Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And man, I've got a really cool guest today. This is literally one of the most talented and successful sidemen we've ever had on the show. He's a lovely human being on top of that, which is a massive bonus. And um, just pleased to have him with Richard Bennett. Uh, quick announcement, I just want to thank Jason Ringenberg for hooking us up. Jason, thank you very much. Yeah. And, and also make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and click that little icon. It looks like a bell. We appreciate that. It helps us with the YouTube algorithms. All right, Richard Bennett, one of the, like I said, one of the most successful sidemen I've had on the show. He's extremely humble. He's been Mark Knopfler's guitar player in the studio and on the road for the last 26 years and spent 17 years before that as Neil Diamond's guitar player, again, both studio and touring. And I just want you to think about the significance of this. These are two of the most talented musicians and artists around. And they literally can have anybody they want. And they had worked with Richard for a combined total of like 43 years. So that's pretty powerful. Uh, he's also produced records for Neil Diamond, Steve Earle, Emmylou <coughs> Harris, Joe L. Saunier, and, and Marty, Marty Stewart and others. Sorry about that. And uh, I'm going to read like a really small sample. His sidemen list we'd be here for two hours but um his first session was in 1968 and bear in mind for most of these artists or for many of them richard just didn't do a one-off this was a, a guy who played on three four five six eight albums of, of these artists alabama eric anderson big al anderson joan baez marty ballon the bellamy brothers kim carnes diane carroll al casey Roseanne Cash, David Cassidy, the Partridge Family, Chubby Checker, Petula Clark, Rodney Crowell, Steve Earle, Vince Gill, The Four Tops, Marvin Gaye. I mean, look at this diversity. This is incredible. Uh, Emmy Lou Harris, Thelma Houston, Waylon Jennings, Billy Joel, <laughs> which he played on, I think, his first three albums, George Jones, Miranda Lambert, The Letterman, Patty Loveless, Dave Mason. <laughs> who we had here on the show a while ago. Mac McAnally, who was on here as well. Reba McIntyre, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Leroy Parnell was on here. Uh, Helen Reddy, Jim Stafford. I love that guy. Nancy Sinatra, <laughs> Barbara Streisand, Weird Al. Did you play with uh, Chemo West? Or was that uh, yes, yes. I played on uh, just a couple of things on Al's uh, first album. Okay. First album. And I also played on a little EP that was, that he put out just prior to that. So it was kind of prior to Jim, just prior to Jim getting in. And I love Jim. God, Jim is such a great, he's a great rock and roll player, but he's a master slack key guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Lovely guy too. His, uh, it's funny that yeah, we're, we're, we're talking to his, uh, he came on the show a second time, and that show dropped this morning, which is funny. Oh, good. Yeah. My my brother plays drums with Al. Oh, wow. And has from day one, pretty much. That's um, cool. Yeah. That, John Schwartz. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me just finish this. this is Dwayne Eddy, Glenn Campbell, The Ventures, and about a <clears> dozen <throat> soundtracks including the Wrecking Crew documentary and one of my all-time favorite movies, man, Westworld. I'm going to ask. <laughs> I love I remember that movie came out. I was like riveted. Man, that's like musical whiplash. Just, you know, <laughs> just hearing that list, it's musical whiplash. Uh, golly. Yeah, Westworld. Uh, uh, I think it, uh, the arranger was Fred Carlin as I recall on that. And the most memorable thing about it to me was that it was like an 8 a.m. call at MGM out in Culver City. And I did a couple of three days on it. And uh, holy Christmas, man, getting anywhere in LA, even back then for an 8 a.m. out <laughs> to Culver City, which was far away from where I was living. Yeah, that was, I earned my money just Good driving there. <laughs> yeah, man. That, yeah. Did you have any interaction with like anything outside of the music or like did you, any inside secrets or that, that was just such a cool flick? Yeah, no, I don't. I, what, about, about the soundtrack? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, no, you know, you just turn up and, the, and you've got a, a, a sheaf of cues 
on your stand. And man, you set them up and knock them down and <laughs> onto the next one. Um, I don't even know that I saw the movie. Uh, maybe I did. Oh, but I, so cool. I was really amazed a few years ago when they revived it. They did. I, was that good? I haven't seen that. I saw, we watched the first season and that was pretty good. And then the second season, as often these things do, I, I, don't, I lost interest in it. It just kind of went kind of sideways. Yeah. Of course, the whole thing is sideways anyway to begin with. But. Right. Right. Well, I'm going to go back and watch that movie now because I never really paid attention to the soundtrack. Now I'm going to because that's great. It uh, may not be any good. I don't know. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't heard it myself. Uh, Richard's also released six solo instrumental albums of his own. And I got to tell you, when I <clears> sat down to listen, my intention was to listen to the most recent one. I was so drawn in. I literally listened to the entire catalog. And he is a just brilliant musician and writer. Uh, it's got great arrangements on there, great songwriting. It's a combination of sort of like surf, Hawaiian, acid jazz. There's a lot of melancholy sort of slow jazz. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that just makes you feel like you're sort of like in the middle of an Austin Powers or James Bond scene from the <laughs> early 60s, which I love that music, man. Yeah, uh, I do too. Uh, you got some chunky melodic guitars, really well arranged, and other tracks you have like detailed arrangements with horn lines and strings. And uh, it was like Henry Mancini conducting some of that. Uh -oh. uh, and to embarrass him just a little more, uh, I want to tell you that on his first record, which is called Themes from a, <coughs> Themes from a Rainy Decade, <clears throat> inside of it, Mark Knopfler wrote, for almost 10 years now, I've felt very lucky having Richard Bennett as a pal and as a member of the band. His quiet, self-effacing manner hides an encyclopedic knowledge of all kinds of roots and rock music from hillbilly to Hawaiian, played effortlessly on a variety of instruments which appear out of a flight case as big as an Airstream trailer. <laughs> may, his, may his cracking guitar playing find a place in your life as it has in mine and it's found a place in mine so thank you very much man oh well you're very kind you're very no, kind you've been great with me man thank you so much it's really oh. a pleasure to have you on the show yeah well the albums are musical whiplash as well you know <laughs> um but it's just the way i i think and the way i hear music you know uh, and the thing i suppose i've avoided in those records um it's kind of the blues rock thing. Yeah. And not because I don't love it. I do love it. But it's still the thing that everybody does, you know? And uh, so I can do some other, a few other things. So I've chosen to do that, and just go down a, a less traveled road. Good. Y you know, um, with the melodic guitar and the clean guitar thing. It's beautiful stuff on there, man. Your arranging is like incredible, man. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know where these tunes come from. They're just tunes, you know, they're just melodies is all. And, uh, and then, and, and then after you kind of got the thing written, uh, then you start thinking about how do you, how do you want to stage the play? You know, what, what kind of movie do you want to make then with this? And that's when you start dreaming up arrangements and things. So by the time I go in, um, you know, I sp I'll spend a lot of time with the tune before I record it for a couple of reasons. Because I just like to explore the thing uh, and to see what I can do with it, you know, uh, and to see what part I'm supposed to play in my own tune. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's Just really as a, interesting. As a player, as a player. And in the course of that, um, you know, you start getting ideas of what you want the record to sound like. And the other good thing I've found with taking a bit of time before you, before you rush in with something is, is after three or four months, maybe, of living, or even longer living the thing, if it still holds water for you, if you're not bored with the song, then it's worth recording. But a number of things, you know, after you play them for 
a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you're sick of the damn thing, you know? And uh, those are good ones to leave behind. You know, I wrote this down, what you said, and I just started thinking, you said, I like to figure out what part I'm supposed to play in these tunes. And then I wonder if that would be a good way to almost look at your life in a sense. Like if you, if it just seems that if you think like that, it allows you to step back a little bit and let the muse guide you a little more. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's that absolutely a right. smart way for me to look at my life, I think, sometimes. Not that it's, it's bad, but I'm, this is like a nugget here. That you just like yeah, aha, yeah. an aha yeah. moment. I just got like, why not? You know, what, you know, that's pretty cool. It's just like, like you're a very chilled out, relaxed guy, and I admire that. And, oh, well. and I think having that sort of mentality is very, con I don't know which is with the chicken and the egg, but it's very conducive along with that of being. Yeah. Relaxed. Yeah. Well, I mean, just getting back specifically to the music part of it. Uh, it's different hats, you know, writing. Um, I, I find writing is one hat and uh, honestly, it'll be three or four notes that'll skate past my, radar and then you kind of roll up your sleeves and put your visor on and go to work right. that old thing you know 10 percent inspiration and 90 percent perspiration it's true yeah it's true uh so anyway and that's it i'm just scrolling away and playing and scratching shit out and um and and then once i got the thing to where it can where it'll hold water where the where I feel the composition is good, and God, you should you know you should hear me when I'm writing this stuff. I, the guitar is not even in tune. I'm not even paying attention to being a guitar player. I'm writing a song. I'm writing a melody, and uh, so anyway, once that's done, then you put you put the guitar the musician hat on, the guitar player hat, right, and uh, and then you got to figure out how you want to act in your own play. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a given Yeah. while you're, while you're writing it. You're just writing a tune is all. Then you got to figure out how to play it and make it interesting for three or four minutes or something, especially with instrumentals. Um, songs are, are different because you've got lyrics that kind of feed you through the song, that guide you through the song. Instrumentals, you've got to make interesting. Yeah, because you don't have the lyric aspect of it, and and, and I find a lot of what well, little instrumental music there is now, um, particularly guitar music, very uninteresting. Well, it's funny. I mentioned I had a Delbert on earlier. He, he he made a comment. He was talking about it. He goes, "Man." no more guitar masturbation i'm so sick of that <laughs> well that's exactly right yeah. and and there's that's it there's two forms of guitar instrumentals now forever yeah and it's either that just up you know up like a machine gun full of notes and coming up with some kind of riff groove thing to just blow your brains out with <laughs> or it's somebody who's you know doing their idea of a surf thing and it's just the same damn thing over and over and it doesn't go anywhere yeah you know it's a lick that goes on for three minutes and it just doesn't go anywhere so i'm kind of into that really old-fashioned way of writing instrumentals they have to hold up and uh and i've i've never been that kind of a player to well i've never been good enough to to be able to you know, spray around a million notes and do that kind of playing. So I, I have to have a tune to play. Just like jazz guys have to have a tune or used to have to have a tune to play. Yeah. You know, they were playing show tunes and, you know, they had melodies and they'd start out and then they can go drift off into whatever. And then they bring it back home to the, you know, to the head again. Right. They were melodies. 
They were well, songs. I listen to slow guitar players like you and David Gilmore any day. Mm. <laughs> I love David. Yeah, I love David Gilmore. I, I just, I just don't have the facility. I never did to be a fast player. Yeah. Believe me, I wish I did, and I've tried to work on it. If I did, I'd spray around a million notes too, <laughs> but I, can't, I can't do it. Well, it's not something you want. You probably want badly enough, you know. Well. It's nice to have in your back pocket, though, as a tool, isn't it? <laughs> Where you can just sort of, you know, you're going along, going along, you sort of have a little explosion, a little flurry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I want to ask you one important question I didn't give you before we get started. How is your cobalt wheelbarrow held, holding up? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> How do you know about the cobalt? Did I write you about the cobalt? You wrote? No, you wrote. <laughs> you didn't write me about <laughs> wrote a post about it on your on your website or oh, somebody yeah. put a post on it so i i just made a little note <laughs> man i've been hauling shit all over the place <laughs> you know taking it from a to b and the back to a again <laughs> just to use the wheel <laughs> <laughs> you seem very happy with that purchase so I oh, just... <laughs> i'm very pleased with it yeah. it's what it's one of those double wheel jobs so it's real stable <laughs> you know, two two wheels on the front. Right, right. Uh, yeah, oh, it's, it's good. <laughs> all right. All it right. doesn't take much to make me happy, you know. Hey, man, I'm the same way. That's, you know, I, I want a cigar and a cup of coffee. I'm good to go. Yeah, man. there you, you know? go. Yeah, there you go. A martini at the end of the day. Absolutely. Hey, tell me the story, uh, how you were first discovered in Arizona. It's a really nice story. And also talk about what you were doing just prior to that <clears> time <throat> musically. Um, discovered is a very important word. It, it, <laughs> I more or less just leaked out. I, I wasn't discovered. But no, I was a kid. I was a kid uh, taking guitar lessons, and and uh, you know found my way very young into uh, the country beer joints there in Phoenix in the mid '60s. I, I was I wasn't old enough to drive. My parents used to drop me off in these really fucking end of the end of the world beer joints. Um, I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't leave my kids there. <laughs> Maybe my parents didn't like me. I don't know. Uh, but they were kind of <laughs> somewhat rough joints. Yeah. Kind of chicken wire bandstand kind of places and fights and all of that um and that's what i was doing you know playing from nine to one on friday and saturday night making six dollars a night really happy to get that holy shit you know? yeah yeah and of course i was a, i was a kid I, like i say i was I, I was 14 years old and 15 years old and the next oldest guy in the bands in these bands maybe would have been in their mid 30s or early 40s you know and so i was really a, a, a baby in the thing and we were playing country music and and because of the age of the rest of the guys we weren't even playing 60s country music we were playing music of their youth right so i came up playing, you know, 40s and, and 50s country music. Bob Wills and Hank Williams and, you know, Fair and Young and Webb Pierce, those things, that era of things. Uh, so anyway, that's what I was doing. Uh, and I suppose if I was discovered, the guy who taught me how to play guitar, a fellow named Forrest Skaggs in, in Phoenix, um, had had taught um, a fellow named Al Casey 15 years prior uh, to me. And Al, by that time, had moved to Los Angeles and was part of that so-called wrecking crew mob bunch. And, uh, you know, Al came back to Phoenix one weekend, Al and his wife, Maxine, uh, to visit Al's folks and his sister, who's still were living there and uh, came by the, the store to see Skaggs. And uh, man, they pulled up. I watched them pull up 
in front of the store in a little yellow convertible MG that they drove out from Hollywood. And they walked out of this thing and they looked like movie stars, man. They were dressed so cool. They just were it. And they came in and, uh, you know, Skaggs introduced me to Al, who I was a big fan of Al's before I even knew anything about him or that Skaggs had taught him. I was a fan of Al's back in the 50s before I knew who he was. He played on a couple of my favorite records where, where The Fool was, was The Fool by Sanford Clark okay. in 1956 with a really great guitar riff on it that turned out to be Al Casey. And the other one was uh, Endless Sleep by Jody Reynolds. And it had this sort of undertow throbbing uh, tremoloed guitar. And that turned out to be Al Casey as well. How, how so, did you, sorry, to interrupt. one question. How did you look, the, how did you know those things? Like, where did you go for that information back then? Was it on, on the back of the records, I guess you had it? No, I found out after the fact, after I'd begun taking lessons from Skaggs oh, okay. about Al Casey, and he played on this record and that record and that record. Okay. So I kind of knew all of this by the time I'd met him. And uh, anyway, you know, they were very sweet to me. They were very sweet to me. And I, you know, I played a, a, a version of Wildwood Flower that was at such breakneck speed. I was so nervous, you know, but they were so sweet and they were kind to me. And the thing is that at the end of, uh, they spent a weekend and they were in and out of the store all weekend. And by the end of that weekend, I knew what I wanted to do with my life specifically, that I wanted to be a studio musician. I didn't know how I was going to do it but I knew I was somehow going to do it. What, what, what about that? What was the, you know, the turning point that like stimu that got put that in your head? It was that weekend with Al and Maxine. Just spending the time. I wanted, I wanted to be them. Yeah. And plus I always had a thing about records since I was a child. And, and that's another thing. I, I sort of had a vaguer, uh, a more vague um, idea that I would like to be somehow involved in records. I didn't know how, I, I was too young. I hadn't begun playing anything at that point. So the idea of being a musician was out of the picture, but I thought maybe somehow I could somehow be involved in playing on records. But that weekend with Alan Maxine cemented that that's how I wanted to be involved in records, you know. Uh, you had mentioned your brother was a musician. Did you come from like a musical family? Uh, yes and no, not a professional musical family. My mother, uh, as a as a young girl and a teenager, an early adult, uh, sang light opera around Chicago and on the radio. And she was very creative in a number of ways. Um, and my dad was an amateur, a pretty good amateur accordion player, but he didn't make his career at that. Uh, but he was involved in radio and advertising at the time. So there was creativity and there was music and there was records around the house and all of that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, and then Al, to close the story, didn't he bring you out to LA? Or is, uh, well, a, a couple of things happened. My uh, sophomore year in high school, my parents moved to LA because of my dad's job. So of course I went out there with him. So I was able to hang around with Al and, you know, do go to a few sessions and stuff. My third year of high school, we all moved back to Phoenix again. Oh. Um, and uh, <laughs> then my senior year of high school, they went back to, to LA. And I stayed in Phoenix to kind of finish off my high school and really to, to kind of finish off some studying with Skaggs. I was working pretty regularly in the evenings then, and I wanted to be working. And anyway, my folks were really good about that and let me stay back uh, for my senior year. And the day after I graduated high school, 
that's when I went to LA for good. And that that's was cool. the, the summer of uh, 69. If, if you're comfortable answering, where did you like live? That's a young age to be on your own. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I spent uh, about six months of that with my grandparents okay. who were living there. And then it just kind of got to be a bit much for them with me traipsing in at two in the morning from a gig and, you know. And uh, so I went and spent the last three months with Elbert Skaggs' place. Oh, that's great. And, cool. and lived with him. Yeah. That's great. But, I, you know, I, was, I, was, I wasn't sort of a kid to kind of take advantage of that. I think a lot of kids might have done that. Um, I did, and I was really a pretty straight arrow. And I knew that I had to continue to get, you know, halfway decent grades in that last year of high school. Uh, otherwise, my folks would yank me out of there and bring me back to L.A. And I really wanted to, st I really wanted to go to L.A., but I really wanted to spend that last year in Phoenix and uh, kind of finish my work with Skaggs. What do you attribute that to the, um, you know, your sort of uh, discipline or, uh, you know, you didn't want to take advantage and, you know, you weren't out partying yeah. all night long. You, I mean, your sense of responsibility was pretty big for a young yeah. kid. Yeah. Yeah. I was an adult at a young yeah. age. Uh, and I somehow didn't have that gene that I needed to go carouse around and, and raise a lot of hell. I was, I was so into music already that that was my focus a hundred percent. And I didn't want to fuck that up. Oh. I didn't want to screw that up. And, and I was out, <laughs> you know, I was out playing in these beer joints where all of, all of the other kids my age were trying to get in them. I was in them, yeah. you know? So I, I didn't really need to do that. It so wasn't that. taboo. No, yeah, no, and I wasn't drinking, and I wasn't. I don't know. That That's all came really. Later. That all came later. Okay. I, I, I had, I, I had my teenage rebellion much later in my life. Okay, but cool. I did, I didn't have it at the time. You know. Yeah, that's really unusual. That's awesome. There you go. Well, it worked out well. For yeah, it worked out well for I, it. Yeah. What I needed to do. Yeah. Once you started, so you move out to LA. How did you get into sessions? Once you got there, did Al bring you in on something or? Uh, yes. Uh, although he didn't throw me a lot of stuff. The best thing Al Casey did for me. And he, you know, he'd occasionally, we'd occasionally sit down and he'd show me things. Uh, but not even so much that. There were two really important things that he and Maxine afforded me. One was his music store that I had a place to go to every day and teach and be there. And most importantly, meet all the guys who came through there. Oh, so he got you right in the middle of the network. Yeah, yeah. Oh. I met everybody. That's so cool. And, and they were smart. It wasn't a big music store. It was like in a strip mall. And it was kind of a, a long shotgun kind of thing. <clears throat> it was primarily a guitar store, of course. But they were really smart in that they stocked, you know, they stocked a big variety of reeds. So all the horn players had come in and mouthpieces and sticks and heads for drums and brushes and, you know, stuff, you know, stuff for everybody. So all the session guys came there to get all their little utility stuff. So I met everybody. Oh, that's great. Uh, so that was great. And the other thing was that Al used to take me around to sessions all the time. So, you know, I'd walk in there with Al and, you know, I'd, he'd set up a little chair next to his little station. And it was a case of uh, keep your ears and your eyes open and your mouth shut. Sure. And just watch how this goes. And as I said, I was beginning to know the people at these sessions already. So I was kind of like a mascot, you know, and if I was okay with Al, I was okay with them. Right. And uh, so that was, that was a great entree. And uh, I did my first session. Uh, God, I was, I just turned 17 by a week. 
in August of 1968, and I was spending the summer, my summer vacation, out there with Alan Maxine before coming back to Phoenix to finish my high school. And uh, I went to a two o'clock session with Al, and there had been three guitar players called, and only two had shown up, which was very unusual. That was very unusual to happen, but either somehow the call got screwed up or something happened. So the second hand passes to, and everything was very businesslike. You, you know, if it was a two o'clock session, the downbeat was at two, you started at two. And uh, so they waited around for about five minutes and H.B. Uh, Barnum, who was the arranger said, well, look, let's, let's run the charts until so-and-so got here. I forgot who the missing guy was, which they did. They ran three charts. And it's now 2.30, and it's pretty clear that the guy's not going to turn up. And uh, the producer asked HB, the arranger, what do you want to do? And before HB Barnum could answer, Al said, well, my buddy here plays guitar. And HB said, give him a guitar. Let's go. And that was my first Hollywood proper union record date. And, you know, you talk about keeping your, your ears and your eyes open and your mouth shut. While they were running those charts, I was paying attention. Right. Not that I, not that I thought I was going to play on it, but just because I always paid attention. And it served me well. Because, <laughs> man, I just, want, I just wanted to crawl out under the door when they said, give him a guitar. But I did it, you know. I did it. And the funny thing was... It was, uh, if this gets long-winded, just edit this. I know you will. But. No, no, no. Go ahead. Talk. It's interesting, man. Uh, Length is never was, a problem. The, if it's boring. This was, <laughs> yeah. Problem, which this yeah, is right. not. Which this is not. This was still at a time when record companies, if they smelled a hit, or if a record started breaking in a region or something, another record company would swoop in and cover the damn thing and try to beat the hit out. And <laughs> Is that so the that's, strategy? Is that why all those, they had so many covers of records? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's right. That is really interesting, man. Yeah. I feel like... Oh, yeah. A I record, a, a hit record could have several, several other hit versions of it on different labels. Yeah. And they were just trying to, they were trying to scoop each other. Um, so anyway, there was, there was a record... Um, by Johnny Nash that was starting to break, I think in Houston or something. And Johnny was the first guy to really bring reggae to America. Uh, even, even though he wasn't, he wasn't Jamaican, but he, he was releasing some reggae records. And the first of, of this was a thing called Hold Me Tight. And I think it bar, Bob Marley written too. And he'd cut it, and it had begun to break. So White Whale Records, based in L.A., decided they were going to cut a cover version and try to beat the hit out and scoop it. Okay, fine. So H.P. Barnum had an acetate of, hold, of Johnny Nash's Hold Me Tight. And he wrote out all, these, all the parts. Well, nobody in the studio had ever heard this music before, and it sounded completely upside down to them. And I remember Johnny Guerin, the drummer, said, HB, man, he said, your copyist has really fucked this up, man. This is really wrong. And HB said, no, it's not wrong. This is how it goes. And the guys couldn't play it. They kind of were stumbling through it. They're the best musicians in the world, but they'd never heard it. So finally, they played the acetate of the thing, you know? And they go, oh, okay, I see. Well, if that's what you want, here it is. And then they, then they could play it, you know? But uh, anyway, in the interim, between, uh, between getting their, they never could get their record out because the, the Nash thing blew up quickly. 
Okay. And it was, it, beca it became the hit. Yeah, so the thing was never released. But I, I have the union contract for my very first record date. That's cool. As well as the check from the ch uh, Xerox of the check uh, from White Whale. And, and guys like Red Calendar was playing bass. Great bass player. I mean, a legendary bass player. And Jim Hall, not Jim Hall, Jim Helms was the other guitar player. And Jim went on to be a big arranger. And uh, Al Casey. And I ended up being the third guitar player. And, uh, you know, a horn section and Johnny Guerin playing drums. Uh, there you go. My first record day. That's cool, man. Yeah. And then I had to go back to Phoenix and, you know, line up at PE and run around the track and stuff. And <laughs> it was like, it was like so a different universe. You know, you talk about alternate universes. Holy cow. It's all I ever wanted to do was play on a record. And then I did, and then I had to go back to Phoenix. And you couldn't even tell your friends because, you know, they, they think you were lying. So I just kept it to myself, you know. You tempted to not go back and stay out and see if you could do more of those sessions. Well, no, I had to finish. I had to finish high school. Just something I you wanted not, to do. Well, not that I gave a shit about it, but it's something I want. My parents wanted oh, me to do. Oh, your parents would have been livid if you didn't, yeah. Yeah, you sure, you got to graduate high school, yeah. you know. Uh, um, but anyway, as, as soon as I graduated, I, I left the next day and moved out to L.A. Once and, you and then, then things slowly, I mean, things didn't, you know, start happening right away. They don't. But, you know, you do drips and drabs and you, you do a session here and a session there and you meet more people. And, and then slowly things become, start coming together. You know, if you, if you can do the job. Were you working, you, when you went out there permanently, were you working in Al's store again still? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that constantly fed you kind of almost leads maybe even, or opportunities. Yeah, con connections, yeah, just yeah. to meet people, just mm. to meet people and get to know them. And everybody came through there, you know? Joe Osborne come by all the time for lunch, and James came by all the time. So they would, they, they'd take me to sessions. You know, James Burton and Joe would, occasionally drag me around to a session. That's so cool. Yeah, it is cool. It's so fortunate, man. It's so lucky. I mean, the, the serendipity of taking guitar lessons from Forrest Skaggs, who had taught Al Casey, who then took me under his wing. I, 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 you just fall face first into it. You know, there was there was no... There was no planning that. You couldn't plan that. How do you look at stuff like that when it happens in your life? Like, um, do you look at like you're fulfilling destiny? There's a higher power helping you. How do you view stuff like this? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not that spiritual, I'm afraid. I, I don't know that there's a higher power. And I, I'm not sure about destiny either. You know, it's just serendipity. Yeah. Uh, but I, it's happened my entire life. You know, I, I'm the guy that falls face first into a steaming pile of horseshit, and I come up with a dozen roses in one hand <laughs> and a fit and a fifty in the other. You know, <laughs> and it, it's always been that. I've been so fortunate. That's you know, awesome. Good fortune. Yeah, that's fantastic. Just good fortune. Yeah. I keep waiting for it to run out because I tell you, I, I've been so lucky that when it does run out, man, the universe is going to come crashing on me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't say that. That's not going to happen. <laughs> um, you're very humble and it appears you've probably always been that way. What do you attribute that to? Not that you should, not that like, you know, well, I, 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 it, there's a, like humility and arrogance. I'm not saying that, you know, well, you weren't arrogant, you, you know, you want to be the alternative to that, but you're particularly humble in, in light yeah. of your talents and, and, you know, you're just a good person. You know, you're not, you don't seem to, uh, you know, you ever meet somebody and their favorite topic is them. Yeah. Oh, right. exactly. 
You're not so that many guy. people. And, and <laughs> yeah, and my least favorite topic is me. Right. You know, I don't know. I you know I th I think it becomes it starts at being a, you know, like I said, we're talking. I, I'm the confirmed introvert, mm. so you don't go around blowing your horn, and uh, and it's not becoming. I'm sorry, you know. <laughs> And, and the fact of the matter is, the rest of it is, I, I don't particularly think of myself as a, as a great guitar player, even a good guitar player. I, I still, I've always considered myself a, 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 about a third grade guitar student. And I'm not saying that to be humble. It's just how, I think that's a good thing. It keeps pushing you forward, yeah. keeps pushing me forward anyway. And uh, so, so, that's it. There's nothing to brag about. Yeah. And and I I I don't like people who do brag about that. Mark, yeah, that's Mark Knopfler. Mark Knopfler and I talk about that all the time about humility. It's the most important thing you can have. Once you have that, you've arrived at some at a good place. Whether it's musical, whether it's music or life or anything, mm. humility is is a great gift. Um. I have anyway. this expression, and I, when you said some of that, it reminded me, you know, you're a bright guy. Smart people realize how little they know, yeah. and stupid people are the ones that think they know everything. That's been my just observational experience, not of like a, a judgment. It's just an observational experience. Yeah, stupid people or, or uh, uh, insecure people. Yeah. Uh, not that I'm a model of security, but, um, uh, you know, ins extroverted insecure people <laughs> tend, no, to be, right. tend to be tend to be loud mouths and yeah. you know braggarts stuff yeah interesting yeah, yeah but you're super hu humble man um i want to bring up I'm, i could spend like three hours on this but i'm going to bring up a bunch of artists and if you could talk about richard how you got the gig and maybe a cool or interesting story about working with them and where it's appropriate uh any lessons that you learned, uh, whether it be um, musical or entertainment wise or life lessons, anything that, you know, strikes you. Uh, let's right. just start with Mark, Mark Knopfler. Right. Uh, that was simply a session call. In fact, so many of these things, all of them, uh, they, uh, with the exception of Neil Dime, uh, they were just session calls. So you were randomly it, assigned by the producer you brought in for that session? Yeah. Oh yeah. shit. I know. That's what I said too. No, I I, I uh, um was very good friends and still am uh with with the engineer and co-producer of that first uh batch of, of sessions I did with Mark. And and of course Mark had been coming in and out of Nashville a lot at that point. We're talking 1994 now. And um so he and I, even though he and I never met, he and I had a lot of mutual friends together. And I think several of those mutual friends, including this engineer co-producer, had recommended me oh, to that's him. that's great. That's great, man. Um, when you get a bunch of people like... Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. The engineer and co-producers, Chuck Ainley, brilliant engineer and producer. So he was, he was pushing for me. Um, a, a songwriter, mutual friend of Mark's and mine, um, Paul Kennerly, I, I think had something to do with that. And also I think Paul Franklin had something to do with my name going forward. Um, I will tell you, that Mark had reservations about me, and and <laughs> it was it was it was Chuck Ainley who told me this sort of long after the fact after I'd played with Mark for a long time, but uh, uh, because of the Neil Diamond connection, um, because his music he, is his music is just so different. The the music was so different. The, the, it, it the whole vibe is different. Yeah. It wasn't that he didn't like Neil Diamond. Oh, it yeah, was just, yeah. it was such a completely different deal. Uh, and I, I could understand that. Uh, but anyway, so, you know, 
It's like you say, yeah, holy it's... shit, when you get that call. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> yeah, I, got the, I got the call from, I think it was like the, it was either New Year's Day or the 2nd of January in 94, because I remember it being right after New Year's. And it was Chuck, and we chatted a bit. And, and he said, well, you know, Mark's coming to Nashville in March or April, whatever it was. And he, went, he wants to record for t- two or three days. And uh, we want you to play guitar. And, you know, the answer is, of course, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you don't even bother to look at your book. Even if you had something booked that far in the past, you'd, you'd erase it. You know? suddenly be available. So, yeah. Yeah. So the answer, of course, was yes. And uh, so I marked it in my book and hung up with Chuck. And then I, I said exactly that. Say, holy fuck, <laughs> what does he want with me? What the hell am I going to be doing there? So I don't know. I was, I was a bit nervous leading up to it and very nervous, you know, walking into it the first day. But, um, you know, Mark was great. He was really sweet at, at putting everybody to ease. I think everybody was a little nervous about it oh, he's, you know, Mark a big, Toffler. he's like yeah it's, one of the it's top a big guitar deal. players in the world and he's like, yeah, it was a written some big click you know classic classic songs that will last forever yeah you know yeah yeah no everybody was a little on their toes you know but he was very sweet about he's very good about putting people at ease and he's very humble and self-effacing himself in a genuine way you know so that helps put people at ease. So anyway, we t- we kind of sat around for the first hour drinking coffee and you know bullshit and stuff. And uh, anyway, finally came time to address the first tune. And the way Mark will run a tune down, and he still does it this way, um, he'll just go pick up an acoustic guitar sit down on a folding chair and everybody kind of gathers around and he'll just routine the tune for you. He'll just play it and he'll kind of stumble through it himself. Uh, And then he'll play it again. And then he'll play it again. And, And it just gives you time to get comfortable with the tune, gets him time for him to get comfortable with the tune. And then the variables, somebody will take a chart out and sketch out a chart. And then you all the while you're thinking about what can, what am I going to play or what can I contribute to this? And uh, so that was it. But I remember I remember in that first tune it was a tune called Rudiger. It's a great song about a, about a German autograph collector who was a real guy. And how does he come up with these topics? He he like you know this is not like you know my heart's broken yeah i mean he, he's super deep just interesting topics deep but intri- like that's not a normal yeah. topic people write about yeah no he's an observer he's such a keen observer and i think a lot of that comes from you know when he was a cub reporter he's he's got a journalist eye okay here for stuff so he just he just sees stuff going on, and you know he'll occasionally write a love song for himself, but he's generally a third party in the song. You know he's a narrator yeah. and not a participant, if you know what I mean. Right. So anyway, a song called Rudiger. So he's routining the thing down, and I made a point to just go sit right smack in front of him and just sit on the floor there in front of him and watch what he was doing. Watch where he was playing and what he was playing. And I, I didn't know how I was gonna negotiate that, that two guitar thing with him, but what I knew enough was I didn't need to be doing what he was doing. Mm-hmm. I needed to be doing something very different than what he was doing to where I could contribute something but stay out of his territory. He already was doing that. And a couple of things occurred to me in those run-throughs. And anyway, we finally got to our instruments. And 
I, I remember kind of this little line that I'd come up with through the intro and through an interlude and stuff that, uh, so I figured I'd try that out on the run through. Oh, here we go and here goes nothing. He's either gonna throw me out or love it. And he loved it, you know, at the end of the first run through, he loved the line. It was the first thing he commented on. And he said, man, do that. That's that, whatever's going on there, do that. And then I found some other little bits for the rest of the tune. And uh, that began our working relationship. And it, and it holds to this day. I still operate the same way with it, to where I can contribute, but stay out of his hair. Yeah. Was that the first time, or most of the time you're playing, the, you're doing lead stuff on records, or lead and rhythm, no? On as sessions. Yes and no, yeah, a bit of both, yeah. 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 I give you credit because that that's a that's a you're probably like at the first first go out you probably weren't getting any you know you knew you wasn't coming in there for you to play lead guitar on this so I give you right you had to pay super close attention to figure out you know how what you're gonna put in there and what kind yeah, of yeah yeah back stuff you're gonna do yeah that's right you want to add to it yeah you want to compliment him but of course you're not trying to elbow into that spotlight that's not your job yeah uh. So anyway, it's been a it's been a really good modus operandi for working with him, and and it holds to this day. And the fact that I'm still around there is amazing to me. But I'm very pleased to be. Yeah. Um, it's it's the most. It's really the best gig I've ever had, and it's the best gig to have, and it's very challenging, and it's very rewarding. And it's great well, freaking music. You're not like suffering. Music. You know, sometimes yeah. you, you know, I talk to guys and they're like, oh, you know, the great artist, good challenging, but I hate the music. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know, I that's, know. that's really cool. You get like the. It's a, it's a joy to play, you know, when we're out touring, it's a joy to play every single night, you know, and we'll come at the end of a, come to the end of a hundred shows to the very last show and you're, you're still working stuff up in the dressing room and getting ready and <laughs> oh, can't cool. wait to get out and play that show. That's awesome. You man. Know? It's great. That's it's a, absolutely great. That's nice, man. I, I've learned a lot. Tell me, like, uh, tell me one or two things that you've learned through that gig. Oh, I don't know. You know, there's some specific guitar things that, you know, we'll occasionally sit down together and, you know, show each other things. Sure. Uh, so there's there's some of that, uh, but there's a, a a far broader musicality that I've learned. Um, I don't know how to explain it. Um, it's it's definitely not. Again, it goes with the humble thing, and probably goes with his humble thing, but it's definitely not the look at me bit. You know, you just you're there to serve the song. And that's it. And, and however you do that, it can be the simplest thing. It can be next to nothing. It can be uh, an involved part. But you're there to serve the song and, and not draw attention away from it, you know? Or drawing attention to some, some other thing that you're doing or anybody else is doing. It's a very important lesson. It's, and it's one that I, you know, I knew going in uh, from all my years of doing sessions, you're there to serve the song. But man, it was, it's, it's really taken on a, a, a much more important uh, ethic, ethos for me. Thanks. And, uh, yeah. Uh, he's just one of the most musical guys. I mean, apart from being a great, brilliant songwriter and a brilliant guitar player, he's just an overall brilliant musician at hearing things. And, you know, he's a staggeringly good arranger himself. Although not to where he writes it out, but he can tell you, or he can tell, he can tell a string section what he wants. Yeah. And parts and all of that. Uh, 
So yeah, he's fantastic. And the maddening thing about him, I love him so much. Um, I don't think I've ever met anybody. You know, we're all, if you're right 50% of the time, you're a genius. You know? <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, he is seldom wrong. He is seldom wrong. You know, like 85% of the time. Like musically you're talking about. Musically, yeah. yeah. But in other things too, he's an incredibly smart man. That's cool. He's a, he's a very wise fellow. Uh, I think the world of him. I really do. Well, you guys sound like a good fit, man. And I'm glad you got that gig. How about Neil Diamond? How'd you hook up with him? <laughs> Neil, this is going to be another long-winded story. Get you, you know, get your splicing blade out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was, when I, after I'd moved to LA and had been there for about a year and a half, I fell into a very unique situation of, of a, uh, a recording studio that it was Liberace's studio and his manager, their studio called Producers Workshop. And they put a couple of guys in charge of the studio one was a business guy, and one was a fellow named Ed Cobb. Ed Cobb was the bass singer in a group called the Four Preps. Mm -hmm. The Four Preps had a couple of hits, 26 Miles Across the Sea, uh, and a song called Big Man, around 57 and 58. Great records. Um, and then Ed Cobb went on to write some songs uh tainted love oh wow soft yeah. cell yeah well soft soft cell did the, the yeah there was the another one. version of it yeah but the early, the original version and muddy water by uh a dirty water by the standells okay and he produced that and uh it was a big r b hit that he produced by ketty lester called love letters uh, a song from the 30s, and it was a great R&B arrangement. So he was he was a songwriter and a record producer. So they put him in charge of the creative end of the studio. And his idea was to do in L.A. what they were doing in Atlanta and what they'd done in Memphis and what they'd done in Muscle Shoals, and, um, which was to get a house band and people would be attracted to the studio because the house band did a certain thing. It had a certain uh, style. Okay. Yeah. And, a, and a certain sound. It was a great idea. It worked in Memphis. It worked down south. You know, LA was just the wrong town for that. And it was the wrong time for it, I think. Um, LA just didn't work that way. That's interesting. But anyway. Anyway, they, they did that. They, they had a go at doing that. So to that end, they brought a bass player from Atlanta, Emery Gordy Jr. out. And Emery was involved in a lot of Atlanta records. And Atlanta was a, one of those hubs as well. And uh, a drummer friend of Emery's who also was involved in a lot of records there in Atlanta, Dennis St. John. The, the keyboard player they brought out from Memphis was Spooner Oldham. Oh yeah. Legend, legendary songwriter and keyboard player. And Spooner had had his run there in Muscle Shoals and had his run there in uh, Memphis. And Spooner was wanting to move out to LA and give that a go. So they snagged Spooner. And then they were looking for a guitar player. A lot of the guitar players didn't want to mess around with that because it was a, you were there five days a week and it was a, a salaried thing. It wasn't a union thing. And man, session guys didn't want to do that. They could make all kinds of money doing record dates and playing with everybody going around town. They didn't want to be stuck in that. I, I hadn't established myself well enough quite yet. And here was a chance to, play on records five days a week. Yeah, be working had, all the time. Yeah. We worked it, it all like the a time. Great deal. 
and with these really good musicians who were very different than I was. I learned so much from all three of those guys. And to be in a studio five days a week, well, I jumped at it. It was like going to school, you know. It was as much going to school doing that as it was going around to regular record dates with, you know, Casey and those guys. And, you know, they brought in all kinds of stuff. We had stuff to do five days a week. We worked every day. And some of it was good, and some of it, we did porno soundtracks. We did jingles. We did folk albums. We did uh, a couple of Liberace albums, which were great. He was terrific. Uh, we did Letterman albums. Uh, you know, we did some rock and roll stuff. We did the Standells there. Every day, you never knew what you were walking into. So it was a great training ground. So I, I can get deeper into that, but I won't right now. Um, Funny that they... That, so, the the thought of uh, <clears throat> porn would go into a session and produce <laughs> that, yeah. that whole concept is pretty funny, but yeah, I know, I, I know, <laughs> I know. You know, and you just you, you just sort of play random, whatever the fuck, rock and roll, yeah. psychedelic, but, but, psychedelic music, and it'd be on this porno. Film, I know, it's know? like, <laughs> wait, we need music to this. What? I, I, know. <laughs> I know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's funny. So anyway, <laughs> the drummer, Dennis St. John. Uh, Dennis had subbed occasionally for Kenny Rogers in the first edition oh, yeah. of the drummer in that. And the guy who managed Kenny Rogers, this guy's partner managed Neil Diamond at the time. Neil Diamond at the time. So Neil, they were looking for a new drummer for Neil. So Ken Fritz, Neil's manager, uh, I guess called, uh, asked his partner, Ken Cragen, who looked at Kenny Rogers. Of, your recall is phenomenal that you know all these names that's yeah fucking it's like, a it's amazing the garbage that's in there <laughs> if i could if i could clear that out i could make so much more space for new stuff, for new stuff. <laughs> yeah uh, anyway it, it was recommended that dennis st john to call dennis so anyway they called dennis to go out on a weekend for neil dennis didn't want to do it dennis didn't come to LA to go on the road. He came to LA to establish a studio career. Anyway, they kept calling and they kept calling. And I think finally Neil got him on the phone and said, look, man, just come out for a weekend. So we'll leave, we'll leave Friday. We'll play Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. You'll be, you get a red eye home. You'll be back for your session, 10 o'clock session, Monday morning. Just come out for the weekend and do it. So Dennis did and was absolutely smitten by Neil and the whole thing. So that went on for about three months of Dennis going out doing weekends with Neil. At some point, and he and Neil hit it off big time. They just became best friends. And at some point, Dennis, who was a born leader, said to Neil, he said, look, you know, you need a better band. You're in a transitional period artistically. Neil's band was the band he brought out from New York when he moved to LA in 69. And Dennis said, look, I can put a better band together for you. And he said, I'm working with these guys and it's a great rhythm section and you're gonna love them. And that was it. It was a done deal. I, again, you know, falling face first into something great. We never, we never auditioned. That's amazing. It was That's just, was just a thinking. done, a done deal. And Neil, I remember Neil coming down to the studio, producer's workshop there, just to say hi, to meet us and say hello. And, uh, you know, by the way, rehearsals will start in January. And all of a sudden, I'm in the Neil Diamond band. So did you all have to quit your, I mean, you had to leave there? Or what was it initially well, just for weekends? Or it, what was it was it? very tricky. It was a very tricky situation. 
because Neil was only working weekends, so it didn't impact our work there at producers. But producers, because they were trying to build a unique sounding band, they had a rule. You were free to go out and do other sessions if nothing was going on down at the studio. But no, I forgot what it was, no two or no three of you could work on the same session. Oops. It was kind of a cockamamie yeah, thing. Yeah, which is kind of know? a weird, yeah. Yeah. It's a weird rule. But the whole thing was kind of cockamamie anyway. Um, but, but, so here we all go out to go and be in Neil Diamond's band. But the thing was, they allowed that because they thought, ah, oh, great. Oh, uh, Neil's Neil going to come Diamond's and record there. The Neil's going to use <laughs> our studio. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> and, and then everybody left. <laughs> the, the producer's thing blew up. But in the meantime, you know, Neil was starting to happen. And I was starting to get a lot of outside work. And yeah. I immediately began recording with Neil right away. Uh, so that would have been uh, Song Sung Blue and Play Me. Wow. The songs that came off that album, I was uh, I started working right away with them. But I think because I had a little bit of a reputation already in L.A. as a little uh, up and coming yeah, yeah. session player. And and the other guys still had not yet. They still were kind of Atlanta guys. So they hadn't quite broken into the L.A. thing yet. So you were so working, I, you were hustling, you were killing it. I mean, really working your butt off there. You were working five days a week initially in the studio and then you were doing yeah. fly dates or recording with yeah. Neil on the weekends. Holy right. shit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah you, can't great. you can't sustain that only so long. Well, when you're 19, you can. Yeah, that's just true. Right? That's 19 true. and 20 and 21. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my studio thing really began to, to, develop into a, a a daily thing where you're doing two or three a day and uh, you were getting calls you know from all over the place so i was I, I i was happy to let the little producers workshop thing go although i loved that little band so much and we would occasionally work together on outside stuff but not. Mm. so so but neil didn't we, bring we, the we, other guys along <clears throat> he, i'm neil, sorry wow. say that again Sorry, Neil wound up not bringing the other guys along, just you and Dennis. Uh, where uh, for touring? Yeah, or for recording? He, for, no, we all went as oh, we all went as a band touring. Okay. Uh, but for recording, I I was the initial one to come in, and then gotcha. later the guys, the other guys came in. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. We recorded as a band after that, and that was a really great band, I have to say. I, I don't, I'm not one for going back uh, very much, but as it turned out, I ended up uh, going back three years ago and, and doing what ended up being Neil's last tour, the 50th anniversary tour in 2017. And, and we'll get into that later, but, uh, but it caused me to go back to listen to the old records that we'd made and my God, that was a great band. Whatever he thought of that music, if he didn't like it, it's, you know, it's, he liked it's it or he didn't. Great songs, I, I loved the it. The band, the band was great. It was really tremendous. Um, so anyway, um, that's how that happened. That's uh, crazy. The thing. And then that lasted 17 or 18 years. That's amazing, man. I mean, you know that in your industry, that's not, that's, Oh, I know. That's like a thousand yeah. years. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. Believe me, I, I don't take that for granted. That's really I cool. I know how lucky, that, how lucky that is. And I hung on to that for a couple of more years, even after we moved to Nashville and uh, my career was starting to get going here. I, I still held on to that Neil gig till 87. 87 was the last year that I, I did that. Here's a guy I don't know if a lot of people know about him, Eric Anderson. Yeah. How did you, he had that, I got turned on to him. He had that one song. Oh, I just thought it was great. Ghost Along the Road. Was that what that is? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know a lot about Eric, uh, apart from that he was an East Coast folk, folk guy. 
there too. I mean, that was just a, a session call that I played on. That was one of a handful, a handful of things on that particular album they were doing. Mm -hmm. I think, I think the album was called old 55 maybe. And I think that was one of the songs that I played on. I have to go back and, and look to see if anybody's interested, but, um, but that was it. It was just a couple of days work. You know, so much of that is that some of it turns into multiple albums that you do with people. And some of it's just a, you know, one or one or two session thing. This got to be interesting. Marvin Gaye. Yeah, <laughs> that's that too. You know, after Motown moved to LA, we all ended up doing Motown sessions uh but i couldn't tell you what a lot of times you were just playing on a track there wasn't even a a singer there or if it was a singer it was a kind of a scratch vocal and didn't end up being didn't end up being the artist that sang it and to be honest with you the only thing i remember about it nothing is in particular other than as i was going through my date books um assemble trying to assemble a discography is that I had a couple of sessions there and Marvin Gaye was listed as the artist I couldn't tell you anything about yeah. what song it was if he was even there at the time yeah you know? there's a lot of that goes on that you just end up being on somebody's record and you they weren't there <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Now, Billy Joel I, I think if I did my research he played on like his first three records yeah, his first two. Uh, well, not his first two. I didn't or play second on the, and third, maybe the second and third. So okay. it was Piano Man album, and uh, the one that followed. I forget the name of it. Um, and that too was just a a session called uh, uh, Michael Stewart uh, was the producer, and and Michael was in the We Five. Uh, uh, the hell song did they have? It was a big folk pop hit. I can't think of it now. Friday on my mind. No, that was, was that. That was the Easy Beats. Yeah, that was the Easy Beats. Yeah. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, he'd gotten into producing, and uh, you know, I'd done some sessions for him for other artists, and he ended up with Billy on that first album and the second album. So I just got called, you know. That was it. And uh, those were interesting sessions because he was, you know, because he was a piano player, rocker, you know, as opposed to a guitar rock guy. So his approach to songwriting was very different. And then he had these very different songs, you know, Billy the Kid and yeah. Cap Captain Jack, which I loved. Great song. Captain Jack. Man, and uh, yeah, and of course, Piano Man. And, uh, you know, that was written about his days in the piano bar there up near LAX, near the LA airport. But they, they were not the usual songs. And uh, I think Jimmy Haskell arranged a lot of that stuff. And uh, he was a very nice guy. But it was one of those things that you got to the end of it and you thought, well, that was very nice. I don't know that anything's really going to happen with this. I just wasn't sure. You know, I didn't know. And I didn't really begin to suspect until I began seeing billboards on Sunset Boulevard, <laughs> that, you know, that Columbia Records had taken out. And you'd go into a record store and there'd be Billy Joel posters. Oh, you go. Wow. Well, maybe something's happening. All right. And then I bought. Then I bought the album <laughs> and listened to it, and I began to understand it a little better, you know. But that was great. But he, uh, you know, he was married to his first wife then, and it, it. I always thought he didn't have a pot to piss on, pissing, um, because she would drop him off at the studio each day. I think they only had the one car. Sure. And it was a little Datsun, red beat up Datsun something or another with a couple of little kind of runny nosed kids in the back. 
and she'd drop him off and do the session and pick him up at the end of it. Wow. And uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, mm-hmm. my, my favorite thing in that, of course I haven't listened to it in years, but uh, it was the last cut on the last side, a, th- a thing called Captain Jack. It's a great song, man. Great song, and I, you know, we tracked the thing, and I, I forgot what I played on the track. I may have played acoustic guitar or something on the track, but Dean Parks was the other guitar player on that day. And you know that, that wonderful riff that runs through that thing in the chorus, Captain Jack, real rock and roll thing. And it was Billy's riff. It was, it was part of the piano part. And, uh, you know, Billy wanted it on guitar to double it with him. And uh, since, uh, no, I was playing electric guitar because I played the solo, the little solo in the middle of that. So I was on electric guitar, but Dean took on the riff. And we were all kind of playing through Princeton amps at the time. We hadn't graduated up to larger amps. And because they were easy to carry around and they were, uh, you could use them in the room and not blow, it wouldn't leak all over everything, you know? They could put a little baffle around it and it wasn't loud enough that it would bleed all over everything. So Dean played this, the riff on the Princeton and it just wasn't, had nothing to do with Dean, who I love and is a brilliant player, and he played it fine. It's just the sound wasn't quite right. And uh, I was already beginning, because I was a frustrated rock and roller at that time, and I, I was already beginning to carry around some larger amps that would be delivered to the studio. You couldn't always use them. but And... Uh, so anyway, at, at the end of the thing, we're packing up and Dean had already left. And I think I went into the control room, either to say goodbye or listen to a playback. I was really into the Captain Jack track. So I, maybe I went in to listen to it. And I, I, I probably had overstepped my station. But I said to Mike, the producer, um, and Rick Malo, who was the engineer, who came from chess in Chicago, moved to LA. Um, I said, man, you know, that's all really, that's fine, but there's just not enough beef in that guitar. You know, there's just enough, not enough welly to it, you know? I said, look, I got an idea. I got a, I got a, a big amp here. Let me haul it out and give it a go. And I had a Les Paul, and I plugged it into whatever amp it was. I forget what it was. And I just fucking opened the thing up. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> th- I think the engineer didn't appreciate it. He came out and kind of backed the mic off a bit. <laughs> anyway, we, we finally arrived at a sound. And I, I played the thing and kind of did the play out and the choruses of it. And man, yeah, yeah, that's great. I said, well, wait a minute, get a load of this now. And I, I was the last guy in the world to carry around a, a Dan Electro six string bass. But I always loved them and I always carried it around and would occasionally find places to use it. But, you know, it was kind of passe by that point. But, you know, leave it to me. So I took out the six string bass and I plugged it into the amp and I doubled the thing down the octave on the six string bass. And all of a sudden the thing really just took off and had some size. So that's me. So that, 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 yeah, I know yeah. exactly the riff you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. And that's then I cool, did some lick, licks at the end of it. But then I also ended up, like I said, played the solo actually on the track on the, you know, when we were, when it went down, so I'm kind of all over that one. That's awesome. But, uh, I'm going to check that yeah. one out. Uh, Helen Reddy, woman who put out some really nice hits. Yeah. Session call. Session call. Don't know. Session call. <laughs> um, I played on, on a cup. I ended up playing on a couple of hits. Uh, one was her version of 
fuck. The Tanya Tucker thing. Uh, Tanya had the country hit on it and Helen had the pop hit. Oh man. I can't think of it now. Uh, and another thing called Ruby Red Dress, which was a hit for Helen. I played on, on that. I'll, I'll think of the Tanya thing. It was a huge hit for Tanya Tucker. Oh, um, 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 um. Delta Dawn. Okay. Delta Dawn. So Helen had the pop hit on Delta Dawn. So and that's what you were talking about earlier, where they'd cover the same song to get some more, yeah. because it was just that accessible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. And uh, so that was, that was a handful of that. And then Neil's producer, Tom Catalano at that time, ended up producing some sides for Helen and I played on those. And then after that, this is the best of it. Do you, do you know the name Kim Fowley? I don't, sorry. No, Kim was the original LA rock and roll madman genius, madman genius. He was a great, he was a great songwriter. He was a formidable looking guy. He was a big, tall beanstalk of a guy who kind of had this square head, almost like a little bit of a Frankenstein head. Um, he was in, uh, oh, shit. Um, uh, he had something to do with Bumblebee and the Stingers and, and Nut Rocker. <laughs> and, and he had, uh, he he was he was one of the singers in in Hollywood Argyle's Alley Oop. We're talking about like records yes. from 1960, and he just was one of those Hollywood hustler guys. And he was out of his mind, but really together too. Very smart. <laughs> That's smart hard. As a, smart <laughs> as a whip. And he produced the Runaways. You know, he got into oh, pop sure. music and stuff. And he was either the co-writer or the producer of popsicles icicles this is a great psychedelic record he was all over the place all the time and he was always hustling everybody was hustling and uh so anyway uh somehow helen reddy landed on kim's lap not on his lap on his plate right for him to bruise some records so uh, uh, uh an arranger friend of mine who had done some work with Kim, I'm sorry, it's all, it's all hard to piece together, uh, was, was arranging these things for Helen that, that Kim was going to produce. So the arranger got me in on these sessions and they were wild, man, and they were great. And Kim and Helen together, it was like, you know, they were from other planets, <laughs> but it all seemed to work out. So I played on a couple of albums that Kim produced for Helen. And then that was, that was the last, my last encounters with Helen. But in the course, I'll just tell you another funny Kim story. In the course of, you know, working with Helen and him, I, you know, I tend to take to people who are, opposite of me and kind of live sometimes vicariously through them and and kim and i were so opposite from each other uh, but anyway we got friendly we kind of got friendly and he liked me and i i liked him in his own odd way and he calls me one afternoon he said he said richard he says fowley here he said he says he says, I'm going to become the king of M.O.R., middle of the road music, which he was so far away from M.O.R. anyway. He says, I'm the new king of M.O.R. He says, I just got a call from the people, from Frank Sinatra's people, and I'm going to produce him. They want me to produce him. It was because of the Helen thing. You know, it kind of opened up a whole new door to him. He says, I've already written the first song. He says, 
It's called Torpedoes and Tuxedos. And he hangs up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> for Frank, Torpedoes and Tuxedos. Yeah, that's probably not going to be one he's singing anytime. No, anyway, that never happened. But uh, yeah, Kim Fowley, a, a great rock and roll madman. He's worth looking up. Kim he's Fowley. a legend. Is he yeah. still around? No, Kim died about three or four years ago. Um, <laughs> this was the other thing with Kim. He always claimed, and and you know, it very well could be to be um, Howard Hughes' illegitimate son. And Howard Hughes was kind of notorious. Howard was notorious for taking up, you know, with his actresses there when he had. I think it was RKO he owned when he when he had the film company. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so he had an affair with, with an actress and uh, uh, the, uh, Kim was the, the offspring, apparently. And this actress then married a, 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 another actor. I forget his name, but his last name was Fowley. Okay. And that's how Kim ended up with his last name. But Kim swore up and down. And there's been other talk of that as well. That, that he was, he was Howard Hughes' illegitimate. Howard Hughes' son, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, only in L.A. rock and roll you know, yeah. does that happen, yeah. Would you say most of these opportunities came, uh, like what was, a, uh, what was a better asset for your career as far as visibility was it being neil's guitar player or be or just the movement the ex, the growing session the career that you kept having which yeah. which led to more stuff or they they feed they each both other? they both they both fed each other yeah okay they both fed each other i i i don't know that i that many opportunities arose from the Neil thing. It just was its own thing. Occas you know, occasionally a producer would call, man, I want that band. I want Neil's band. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, to some extent, when we get around to Jim Stafford, that's sort of what happened there. Okay. Um, but the, the studio thing kind of generated, keeps generating and regenerating itself. And you're just there and you're playing out records and you're just one of the guys, you know, so you get recommended and, and, you know, and then if you're on, you know, you occasionally get a hit that you're on that feeds more sessions your way, you know? Yeah. And I guess the more people that you meet and that are pleased with whatever you've done, that's probably mm -hmm. the best. Yeah. That's probably the best thing. Oh that Yeah. You got another, I'm just from my own experience of doing the show, to be honest with you, because yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, I could have one great guest on, but it, that's not what makes the show. It's connecting right. with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Talk about Jim Stafford. Good timing for that. Jim Stafford. Well, uh, that, that was sort of an offshoot. Um, of that old producer's workshop thing, uh, that studio group we had. Uh, but by then that studio group had gone on with Neil and became Neil Diamond's band. <clears throat> by the way, I should add that when we all went off with Neil, Spooner didn't. Uh, uh, Spooner was, I think, having some falling out with the people at the studio anyway. And he'd kind of become intermittent in his attendance. And um, so we got another keyboard player in, a fellow named Alan Lindgren, into our studio group. So when that group went with Neil, Alan became the keyboard player. So anyway, I'm trying to think what the Stafford thing was. I think 74 or something. I don't know. But anyway, at that point, we were Neil's band. And... Um, Phil Gernhardt uh, produced that, and uh, I, it was just a session call. He wanted, you know, he wanted that unit because he knew Emery and he knew Dennis, the drummer. Uh, Phil used to record a lot in Atlanta, so he knew those guys from there. 
he knew Spooner <coughs> and Spooner was brought back in for the Stafford stuff. That's right. Up, that's musically. That's a lot more aligned with what he, you know, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. I, and so yeah, everybody knew Spooner and I just came along with the package cause I was <laughs> the guitar player, you know? And, uh, I think King Arison, who was, uh, a percussionist with Neil and a great, great conga player. And, and he was an LA stalwart as well. He'd come up through Nat Adderley through, Cannonball? Cannonball. Oh, yeah. wow. Um, he was on the session. I'm trying to think who else was on the session. Um, I think Kent Lavoy, who went under the name Lobo, who had some hits that Phil produced. And I think maybe David Bellamy of the Bellamy Brothers. Interesting. Who was a co-writer on Spiders and Snakes. He was playing guitar too. And there were a couple of acoustic guitars. I was playing electric, bass drums, Spooner on Wurlitzer. Um, and that was it. The first thing we recorded was Spiders and Snakes. That's a pretty good hit. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a big hit. It's massive. And uh, it was. And, and I remember that session very specifically, like it was yesterday. It's funny how you can remember some things very clearly and other things are just in the fog, you know. But we recorded that at a studio in Torrance, which was a, a, a kind of a South Coast suburb of LA. And uh, a fellow named Donnie Sharada had a kind of a state-of-the-art studio that he built there. A terrible place to put a studio because it was out of LA. It was, you know, it was a 20 mile drive out of Hollywood. He wanted to be in Hollywood, you know, where things were. But anyway, for whatever reason, he opened up a massive high-end um, audio store, like high-end component parts and turntables and amplifiers and speakers and kind of now they would be like home theater installation kind of things. That was the front of the shop. And then he put, he put a state-of-the-art recording studio in the back. So for whatever reason, we recorded that there. And uh, anyway, uh, Jim kind of routined the tune down <clears throat> to us, or maybe David did even, I don't know, Bellamy. And uh, somebody made the comment because it was they wanted it to be kind of a swampy thing mm -hmm. um, in in the rhythm section, but particularly in the in the electric guitar. So swampy, you know, I start going through my Rolodex, you know, swampy, swampy, as you do when you're a session musician, you know. And and the two things that kind of jumped out pretty quickly to me was uh, Tony Joe White pokes out at Annie. Sure. And Jerry Reed's, uh, what is it? What is it? Amos, Amos Mo mm -hmm. Moses. So that kind of got, just got in my brain, in my little brain, kind of got all mushed together into a bit of a mashup. And, and I kind of stuck a wah wah in between it all. And, and that's what came out, you know? That's what came out. So, Are you playing a Telecaster on there? Because that's what <coughs> I think that was a Tele through a Wawa, yeah. or it, you know, it may well have been a three thirty five through a Wawa. I don't remember. It was one or the other. Um, but anyway, so that was all fine. They all liked that, and so we started, you know, doing takes and just putting the arrangement together. And there's a funny Spooner story about that. Um, so after about the third take, it came, to, it came together pretty quickly once we got the arrangement together. And the third take, so Phil Gernhardt's in the control room and he presses the talk back out into the studio. He said, man, that was a great take. He said, I, that may be it. He said, you can come in, let's have a listen. It's worth a listen. He said, and he says, oh, Spooner. He said, I, I don't know what Spooner was playing, Whirly, you know, electric Whirly. <coughs> he said, I, I don't know what happened to your track. I don't think it went into record, but 
If this is the track, you can go back out and redo it. So we all went and listened. Yeah, great, that's it, you know. Jim liked it. <coughs> Everybody liked it. And uh, so Phil said, he got done listening, Phil said, well, let's, let's figure out what's going on with Spooner's track here. So they sold up Spooner's track. And, uh, you know, you could, you could hear the vibrato on the Wurlitzer just going putt, 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 nothing, you know. About a minute and a half goes by, nothing. But clearly the track is working. And then like at the top of one of the sections you hear, you know, Spooner goes, sprang. Pop, 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 till the rest of the record. He hit one little downbeat and that was it. And at, <laughs> at the end of it, Phil said, he said, well, Spooner, is that all you're gonna play? And Spooner was, <laughs> Spooner at that time, he was one of these hair twirler guys, you know, he just always be twirling his hair, have a little lock of it in there. Spooner said, well, he said, that's all I heard. <laughs> and to, to Phil Gernhardt's great credit, he didn't make him play anything else. He was cool with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, wow, that ended that's, up being... that's really trusting your music. That's massive trust. That's like not being controlling. That's a rare thing to allow something like yeah. that to happen. Well, I know the thing is, but when, when that one little sprain came in, it was so good it made the record. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, but uh, you know that was a surprise hit. Who would have thought that was a hit record? Oh, that was massive. That was, yeah, and that got yeah. him a TV show. Yeah, I played on on that I, on some of the pre-records of that. Uh, but anyway, on on the strength of uh, Spiders and Snakes, then we went and did an album to go with it. And then following that, we did a second album, and we did one more single with him, a thing called Jasper Dan. Uh, after that. And then that was it. Um, I always liked, I never was very keen on, on Jim's, you know, his funny stuff, but I really liked his swamp stuff, you know, kind of a swamp witch kind so, of things. And Spiders uh, and snakes, that was kind of like a combination of the two. Of the combination of the two, but he did some serious swamp records, like voodoo kind of records, you know, that were really swampy. One was called Swamp Witch, uh, about, uh, I don't know, about Swamp Witch Hattie or something, and people would go in the swamp and try to find her, and they'd never, they'd never come out again, but anyway, Hattie had come up with some kind of brew that cured illnesses, and Everybody wanted to go see. It's it's great. It was great imagery, you know, mm. about about vines hanging off of cypress trees like snakes and stuff like that, and black water and stuff. Uh, so I always loved his swampy stuff. But anyway, that was Jim. I'm just gonna ask you one more, Glenn Campbell. Mm -hmm. Again, very limited. Uh, contact with him. Although, funnily enough, you know, he and Al Casey were great friends. I would imagine. And worked together so much and Al played on so many of his hit records. Uh, so when Al had the store, Glenn wanted his girls to learn how to play guitar. So I taught the girls how to play guitar. That's hilarious. And his, and his, his wife at the time, I, and I forget her name, you know, would bring the kids in for lessons and I'd teach them. Uh, but I, I played on a couple of things for Glenn. And one was a song called Sunflower that Neil had written. The song, it's a great song, great song. But somehow Neil didn't feel it was for him. And, and we'd cut a demo on the thing with Neil and the demo was killer. I mean, it was a great, it was a record as far as I was concerned. But Neil just didn't hear it for him. So he thought it would be great if Glenn cut the thing. So he pitched it to Glenn and Glenn loved it. So Glenn wanted the band to yeah. cut the demo. So we all, you know, went into Capital A there and 
and cut it. And it was kind of a hit, I think. It's, you know, it's, it's on his greatest hits album. I couldn't tell you how far it got up the charts or anything, but uh, so we did that with Glenn. I, I never felt it was as good a cut as the one, as the demo of it was, but that often happens. That's, you know? it. That's interesting. And then the other thing with Glenn was, uh, and it wasn't for him specifically, but uh, it was for his, the guy who played bass with him on the road, Billy Graham. Not that Billy Graham. <laughs> the bass player, Billy Graham. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Glenn wanted to cut, <clears throat> cut some sides on Billy. Billy was a good singer. With an eye to maybe getting a record deal for him over there at Capitol. So we all knew Billy and Billy wanted us, you know, to be on these things with him. Um, so we, you know, we spent a couple of nights at Capitol recording and I don't know that anything happened with it, but Glenn was there kind of overseeing it. And then that was, you know, that was it. It's kind of short and sweet. Is there any sessions that you you want to talk about that were memorable to you or like just left you feeling really good or that you have nostalgia over or something like that? Well, yeah, I'm sure there were lots of them, but I can't recall them right now, except to generally say kind of in a global way that I always feel that way when I'm recording with Mark. No, it's cool. And we all do. We all do. The very, the great musical experiences and the camaraderie. I mean, that band is so in each other's pockets. I mean, it's just like, it's stupid. You That's know, all. it's just a mutual love affair. Everybody, you know, so we, we enjoy spending time together. And that's the way it is on tour. You know, we, you'd think you'd be sick of each other, but man, there is never a bad day. There's never a cross word. There's never a bad mood. And, you know, from two o'clock on, when you're starting to head over to the gig, maybe for sound check, and five hours down at the gig before you play, and two hours of playing, and you come back to the hotel, and man, you can't wait to go down to the bar and have a drink all together with Mark, you know? <laughs> nice. Or end up in somebody's room listening to music. That's how that band works. It's a it's a real band. Long term, everybody there long term? Yeah. That's yeah. great, yeah. And everybody yeah. of the same age, every, age group? Uh, no, uh, there have been a few younger guys enter into it. Um, uh, a couple of wonderful UK folk musicians, Mike McGoldrick, who's, who's absolutely the, the, uh, the Illin Piper king and, and plays great wood flute and whistles and all kinds of stuff, sitter and bazooki. And, and also John McCusker, who's a, uh, a renowned and awarded, you know, he's gotten awards from the country, from Scotland. Uh, and uh, the two of them make a great team. So they're kind of in their mid 40s. And, and they kind of came in around 2008. Oh, that's a long time now, though, 12 years. Yeah. Right? yeah. And then, and then with this tour, we uh, brought in a little horn section. Uh, Tom Walsh, who's a, he's like 24 years old and he just as well, he's like Methuselah, man. He <laughs> knows, he knows every inch of that horn from, uh, uh, from Louis Armstrong forward, forward. He's like an old soul, you know, and he plays so well. And uh, a wonderful sax player named uh, uh, Graham Blevins. So they're a good team, but they're like the kids. You know, Graham right. is kind of in his late 30s, but Tom's like 23, you know. But well, he is a kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and then, you know, there's the geriatrics like me and, and Mark. <laughs> 70 now. Well, I'm 69, he's 70. Um, 
But anyway, yeah, the band's been together a long time and it just knows, it knows what it's doing. The musicianship is uh, excluding me. The musicianship in that band is staggering. It's st it can do anything. It can do anything. And I always feel like I'm the, you know, the, the loose wheel on it, but, but I, I get my way through it. You know, you somehow you somehow do, you somehow get through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but anyway, it, it, whenever we're recording, that's how we feel, you know, that's just awesome. Great, great times. Yeah. Um, I wish I had a better answer about the other stuff. I just, I just can't think of, of it right now. Sorry. No, it's cool. Let me, I was going to ask you this. Maybe it's, it's uh, just a reframe of the last question. If I ha asked you what the <clears throat> knee jerk reaction to the top three musical experiences you've had. Oh, well, I don't know. They, I, they would be, they would again be very global answers and, and Mark would figure into it. I mean, it was a profound, um, uh, it's been a profound 25, 26 years. Yeah, that's just amazing. That length of time. And, and, and then, you know, Neil would be the next one. I learned so much from him uh, in, in my younger part of my life. You know, I, I became worldly because of him. Uh, and, uh, and he also afforded me, you know, it, it, like Mark, you know, man, they just, they just keep reeling yards and yards of rope off to you so you can go hang yourself you know That's and then they'll save you they'll save you at the end or you know you've proved something to them but anyway neil was always very kind and you know early on saw that i had an interest in writing songs so he would take time and sit down and we'd write songs together you know and and they were songwriting lessons that's uh, at, really at cool. first, you know, they were shit songs. You know, I'd bring him stuff and it'd just be rubbish. And he'd say, well, you know, this here, this bit's good. What if we tried something around that? And blah, blah, blah. And of course, you know, most of them went nowhere, but I, I look back on it now and they were songwriting lessons. And then all of a sudden, you know, we wrote Forever in Blue Jeans, which was a good song and became something. And then we wrote songs some songs after that i mean i wasn't a steady co-writing partner he didn't co-write that much but you know we wrote four or five six tunes together that's all really of which cool got recorded him. once once they got to a certain point yeah. you know of, of being somewhat proficient um so that was it and i learned how to be as you know i learned what it meant to be on a stage what it meant to be to put on a show with him um, that it was, it was serious work, you know, it was serious work. It was serious work every day. Uh, uh, so I, I learned, I grew up and I learned a lot from him. I think a lot of that, had you not been an old soul, a lot of, you know, the fact that, let me reframe that, the fact that you were kind of an old soul and a young kid is such an asset to you, man, because you really got to, you got taken seriously and then you look at the career you had because of that, man. I think that's a you know, feather in your cap. Yeah. Well, I, you have to be, my, you know, the only thing I ever wanted to do was be a studio musician. And while there was, well, there was a lot of camaraderie and joking around and, you know, those guys were great, great spirits and, and jokers and all of that. But, it was a business and it was a deadly serious business. And uh, so you had to be an adult to do that. No, I knew that. I don't mean any disrespect. I'm not trying to argue, but you didn't have to. You chose to. <clears throat> because there were plenty yes, of guys, so. especially in your era, that were not, you know, they were like snorting lines of coke all day long. You yeah. Know, between, well, that, you know. that came. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but obviously it came as a hobby, not as a vocation. Yeah, well. And you know, and, and, and I have to say the other the other really profound event would be uh you know, sort of hooking up with Al Casey. I mean that yeah. was that threw the doors open 
in so many ways. So what, whatever I have done or I have is because of him, yeah. you know, and, and plus he ended up being my best friend, you know, the, the mentor student thing dissolved very quickly and he just ended up being my big brother. You know? That's nice, man. Yeah. Yeah. I was really proud. I got to, that he asked me to produce his last couple of albums and he'd moved back to Phoenix by then, but, um, man, that was, I was so knocked out to do that, you know? So I, I, I did, I did my first session this, next, sitting next to him and he did his last session sitting next to me. That's nice, man. That, yeah. Yeah. And you got to pay it in. forward too, producing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. 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 That was good. So anyway, those, those are three kind of global, big musical events, you know, that changed my life. I want to ask you some questions about your own solo records. Um, <clears throat> I really, really like them. I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. Oh, man. I would say nothing if I didn't. Um, yeah. Much of the music is like, or the arrangements, it's some variation, and this is very simplified, of surf music meets Sergio Leone. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you do a great job of adapting that sort of like vibe to loads of other genres, as I mentioned. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, get, it gets... Uh, tagged as surf music, some variation surf music. It's funny because I don't give a shit about surf music. That's, I never well, did. That's what I was going to ask you. What did you grow up listening? Yeah. What was your, what was like when, you know, when you weren't listening to learn, what yeah. did you like sit and turn on the radio and groove to? Oh, it, it, this, uh, you, the same things you did. The same things we all did. Um, but maybe because I'm just a little older, I, I, I also cottoned on to, you know, it's back then you, they still had hit records, hit instrumental records on right. the radio. Right. So, you know, you had things like, I don't know, in the 50s you had a man with a golden arm and swinging shepherd blues, you know, and the enchanted sea and quiet village and the theme from high and mighty. There used to be a lot of movie themes, themes, themes. And He's in, you know, theme from a summer place, the greatest instrumental ever. And uh, cast your fate to the wind and wonderland by night and last date and our winter love and strange on the shore. These, these were hit records sitting right along next to Elvis Presley and uh, everything else. And the ventures, you know, and stuff right. like that. Um, so it, instrumentals always played very heavily along with just regular songs to okay me. yeah because i didn't recognize I, any of those songs you, and not that i'm music genius at all but i, I mm, that you're right that was a little bit before me and that's what i didn't get to any single one of them is worth going back and listening well, to. i wrote a few down <laughs> theme from a summer place god you, and you will have heard it once you hear it you go oh of course that's, okay that's that the one that. that's the that's the one i wrote down funny enough yeah well, start there. Yeah, well, and uh, or like "Stranger on a Shore" by Alker, Acker Bilk, Acker Bilk. Um, so I had a, that always played heavily with me, and uh, and also you know middle of the road records like you know tornadoes and. Tor Tornadoes and torpedoes, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the yeah, right. But the instrumental versions of those things, like going back to the mid fifties, where they they made these, they were wonderful, shining examples of arrangements of good songs, and and you know, recording the science of recording by the fifties and the and the early sixties were just tremendous. So. You know, I listen to a lot of that, even though people my age, you know, would sneer at that kind of stuff. It would send them skittering to the nearest import bin at tower or something, you know. <laughs> um, but I always found a lot to like about those records. Okay. So that just kind of all just lodges in here. I didn't necessarily make a study of it. I just enjoyed listening to it. And then bits and pieces of it just kind of stay and 
spit themselves out in curious ways or in different ways, you know. Um, but for me, melodic music has, has just always been the most moving. Um, so that's what I gravitate to. Um, you know, and your Morcone. God, what a genius that yeah. guy was. Oh, yeah. Um, and you could, you could sort of tag some of that as, you know, the spaghetti Western stuff. Well, you could call that kind of quasi surf too, maybe. Yeah, I, I, I definitely would. Yeah. The, the, yeah. the same thing that makes that uh, surf ish is what it's your tone more than anything else in there. It's not like you're playing, mm. you know, yeah. but it's, there's a, tw a, a surf twang. Yeah present yeah. it's just your your tone that's what you play it's how you play yeah well of course Dwayne you know Dwayne Eddy's a, a, a an old old friend of mine but you know everybody loves Dwayne Eddy you can't not love Dwayne yeah. Eddy well I do too so so that finds its way in and you know Hank Marvin of the Shadows is is plays huge in my in my record collection <laughs> uh so there's that and and then there's you know the straight up jazz guys like Johnny Smith and Barney Kessel and Howard Roberts and so many of them. That music plays, I don't know. It just ends up like I, like I was saying, you know, musical whiplash. My God, that's what it is. And it's like just taking those giant blocks of stuff, you know, that you like and putting it in a, in a food processor and just throwing it all together and that's how it comes out yeah. of me you know and uh and it's all the better for for that that it's just impressions of those things and not 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 being a slave to any of it you know? i want to ask you about some of your songs specifically your first record uh, i think it was your first, yeah things from a rainy decade it's from 2004 mm -hmm. You have a song that, which your records, this is really hard to name instrumentals, man. And you have all, like you, some of your song names are very cool. And the, the album name, you know, Themes from a Rainy Decade, you know, oh, Valley you of the it's... Sun, <laughs> Contrary Cocktail. I mean, those are cool names, you know, you know, okay, Ballads thanks. in Otherness. It's like, you know, yeah. okay. But yeah. we, they're, you know, they're like intriguing. They're like interesting. Like, okay, let me, just something yeah. called that is worth at least you know and if i didn't if i had no interest i'd listen just let me check that out it's kind of interesting well thank you because that is the whole point of it i think it's such a cop-out to to name your album one of the song titles <laughs> it's just a fucking cop-out man <laughs> You know, put your thinking cap on. You can do better. You but, know? It's, but it's hard when it's instrumentals, man. As you know, it's not like... Well, yeah, know. but it gives, it gives you all kinds of leeway. You're not stuck to a pesky <laughs> lyric. You Very can true. do anything. <laughs> Very true. See, you're good. You look at the glass half full instead of half empty. Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so you get a song on there called The Flaming Palomino. And uh, oh, yeah. I, wrote, yeah. I wrote down... I was waiting for Clint Eastwood to come riding on a horse through my office. Man, what a great, what a cool, cool track. Um, yeah, I know it yeah. was a long time ago. I was just curious if, if you remember what made you put, what was the backstory to that basically? And what guitar were you using? And was that tremolo on there? Uh, That's a long time yeah. ago, man. Well, there's probably, there's probably, uh, there's probably more backstory to the, to the title. <laughs> Okay. Than the song itself, the uh, I, the song the song is just a tune, you know. It's just a tune that came to me, and and but it's a perfect example of, you know. Then once you got your tune, and your and your chords to it, then what kind? What what's the movie gonna be? What's the movie gonna be? And and that's when that whole you know, Pony Express thing oh, that came, was so came out. fucking cool, man. The that Western was... thing. Uh, it, so then you just roll up your sleeves and start going to work and arranging the thing and thinking, well, how, how do you make it that? Um, but the guitar on that uh, was, I do remember the guitar, was a, a 1956 Gretsch uh, Chet Atkins 6120 model. And I know we're not going to get into um, gear talk, which 
I, I'm so glad we're not going to because <laughs> as soon as people start talking about that, it's like my eyes, you know, the, the <laughs> iceberg comes comes floating by. It's, I can't stand talking about gear. But anyway, that's what that guitar was. And um, and yeah, there's just some amp, amp tremolo on it. And and I also remember doing and I, I, I don't get into overdubbing myself a lot on my own records. I just get the I just get the main guitar and I may do if somebody puts a gun to my head, I may do another part. But I'd rather have somebody else play other guitar parts, even if I dictate it to them with and sometimes I do. Um, I just like other fingerprints on it. I, I I'm very i I've become very sensitive to the one man band thing and I don't like it. Um, well, man, you know what? Not that's really cool because you're practicing what you're preaching. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you believe in the session concept, but not for me. You, you know what I mean? That's yeah. cool that you're think that way. I believe in the session player concept because these people add something I don't have the ability to add. So let me do it on my own records. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, it's that's more right. authentic sort of, you know? Well, it's just, it's just other people's, like I said, their fingerprints. Are, it's, you can hear other people playing. Yeah. It's not just you doing everything. I'll tell you what broke me of that, because I used to do that a lot, and I used to take a lot of pride in, you know, con weaving all these parts together. And, and uh, it, the, the, the Steve Earle guitar, al uh, guitar Town album really broke me of that, because that's what I did. I probably played 90% of all the guitars that are on there. Oh, wow. Steve, Steve played a couple of acoustic guitar parts, rhythm guitar parts, but the vast, vast majority of every guitar on there is me, including the acoustic guitar parts, all the electric guitar parts, all the peripheral guitar parts. And um, So, so anyway, I, 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 w I went about this and I got everything exactly like I wanted it. I mean, it was precisely how I wanted it. The inflections, the tone, the parts, the, the you know, the groove of it, every, every single thing. And, and uh, you know something? I, I have a hard time listening to that album now. Not because I don't like the album, I think it's a great album. And, and not that I'm ashamed of anything that I did. But when I listen to that album, it's like walking into a house of mirrors. Yeah. It's me there, and it's me there, and it's me there, and it's me doing this, and it's me doing that. I fucking hate it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I totally get I, it. I like what I played. It's not that I didn't like it. Or no, I, I'm not I totally it. get it. Um, it's just, it's just, a, you know, I'm, <laughs> it's like, look at me and I'm exactly a don't look at me guy. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, back to the Palomino. So the title of the thing, oh, and, I, and I'll just get into one other thing that led me into all of that other nonsense is I, I, I did the unspeakable and I, and I overdubbed a couple of things after <laughs> on that so as as the thing progresses i think on the last play out or something there's a little uh, uh I, I i i doubled the thing down an octave with that dan electro six the six train bass. bass yeah and then i put an instrument called a mandolin guitarophone that's an octave or it could be even two octaves up above the guitar so you really have a wide why? Let me get in the frame. Man, I got to go back and listen to that to hear that. Uh, a, a, a wide range there. Um, so anyway, so to the title of that, um, I, it always had the wide open, um, wide open spaces thing and kind of the horse just felt like a galloping record. It's got that galloping rhythm. Um, but I, I'd originally called it uh, Chaparral, I think was the, the working title. 
for it. And uh, anyway, I, I, I played it for Knopfler, for Mark, who really liked, he really liked that album and, and he liked the cut and all. And, uh, but he said, man, you know, he's a chaparral. People are gonna think it's like the theme from High Chaparral, uh, the, the TV show. And, and it was a point well taken. Um, so then I thought, you know, well, what? It's definitely got this horse vibe, the galloping vibe. Okay, horse, well, you know, Palomino. Well, you know, Palomino wasn't enough. It had to be some kind of Palomino. You know, I don't know. The racing Palomino, no. no. The, uh, I don't know. The galloping Palomino, no, it's crap. The golden Palomino. So there you go. There it is. <laughs> there it was. But this, but you want to call it the flaming Palomino, I think, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so I really liked the golden Palomino. It was that for a while. Wasn't that and a casino? Then, Wasn't that a casino? Well, that I think uh, something ended up shifting golden into flaming. Yeah, that's a badass yeah. name. That's a great. Yeah. Name. So you know, uh, it's either you know a, a badass Palomino. Or it's a very flamboyant Palomino. Could <laughs> <one or the other. laughs> be. That's right. Touche. <laughs> uh, but I, I ended up liking the way the flaming Palomino. Yeah, sounded. great title, man. Yeah. You also have another song on there um, called "Blue at Best," and I just was curious, man. The guitar playing is great on there, but that particular track. The upright bass is who's doing that? That's yeah, that's Glenn. That's Glenn Wharf from. Uh, oh, I know. Desert. Yeah, I know Glenn. He's going to yeah. come on the show. Yeah. Oh, yeah. great. Yeah, he does. Totally. Yeah, he deserves oh, it. Yeah, Glenny's. Glenny's great, and uh, you wow. know, of course, we've done a million sessions together before ending up in Mark's band together, and the drummer on that one uh, was Mark's drummer at the time. A great drummer and great session drummer. Chad Cromwell. Hmm. And we just cut that live as a trio. We were just Great. sitting in the same same room together. Great track, man. Really good. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You got another song on uh, the Contrary Cocktail record. That was from 2015 <coughs> called Our Summer Last. It's a really beautiful track. And, uh, yeah, you know, it's got nice strings on there. But I was curious the backstory of that one. I don't know. No story, really. Um, Again, that these just most of these <laughs> most of these things just turn up as tunes. Yeah, and I write them and then figure out how the hell I'm gonna try to make you know try to make a movie out of it or something. You know, um, I, I, as I was writing it though, it wasn't the initial inspiration. But as it was writing, as I was writing it, I, I began to hear that it might be a little love letter to because they're young, um, which is, it was another brilliant instrumental by Dwayne Eddy. Uh, again, it's not, it's not that, but uh, you know, there may be a little hint of that in it. I don't know. Um, yeah. Our summer last, but I do like that one. Yeah, I like that one too. And then just, just, uh, want to ask you an overall question about your last record, Ballads in <clears throat> Otherness. It's an awesome, awesome record. Um, one thing, the songs have an overall sense of like a little bit of melancholy in them. And, yeah. Which I like. That, that's, I, I, like yeah. I like that. And I was yeah. just curious, was anything like sad or stressful going on in your life that no, contributed to No, absolutely nothing. No. Uh, but, I, but I think a lot of my stuff kind of can be a little bittersweet. I, I yeah. just kind of live there. Yeah. Uh, not necessarily emotionally, but musically, you know? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> um, but, Which is uh, interesting because uh, it, let me frame my question. I'm, I'm trying to articulate it properly. You're not, you don't seem to be that kind of guy. You seem to be a guy that does mm -hmm. look at the glass half full. I mean, not that, you, that, that, you know, we all have shit to deal with, right? And you have good days and bad yeah, days, yeah. all of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But your your music does kind of sit in that pocket. Do, yeah. Do you 
maybe use that as a, you know, like in a cathartic way, like, you know, if you're going to express or, or get some sadness out of you or whatever's inside you through the music, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I wish I could say that I did. I wish I was that good to be able to, to channel stuff like that. Um, no, it, 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 not at all. Um, and I used to, you know, I used to be kind of that bittersweet guy long, long time ago. Uh, I've, I, man, I, I don't know. In my old age, I've become Pollyanna or something. I hate to say that. <laughs> hey, less but, stress. You know, less I've, stress. I, yeah, yeah, maybe so. I've, I've just become grateful for everything. And But no, I, I, I don't know what that's about, except that I think sometimes that bittersweet melancholy vibe really... Uh, I, I don't know how to say this. I, I think some of the most heart tugging music tends to be a, a bit bittersweet. Absolutely. I think you can really, you can really milk a melody. Yeah. You can really milk a melody in a ballad or in a mid tempo, kind of in a bittersweet thing. Yeah. So I, th I think that's why I'm drawn to it musically. I'm not that way myself personally, but it's. Yeah. I love it musically. There was a, a great songwriter, um, friend of mine, who made his living, you know, in New York, in the Brill Building. Um, and he wrote things like uh, Indian Lake for the Cow Sills. And, yeah, uh, I, I know that song. Yeah. And uh, she, uh, I Think I Love You by David Cassidy, by the uh, Partridge family. But his, his real passion was 50s pre-rock and roll pop music. Joni James and Frankie Lane and Rosemary Clooney, that era of pop music. And he and I became very good friends and I, I was always a huge fan of that. That's what I was raised on before rock and roll. And you know, we talk about songs and melodies and stuff. And, you know, he'd, be, he'd, he'd cite some example of a song. He said, now listen to that melody there. And he said, then, then right there, you hear that note? And he said, that's the choke note. And he said it a few times and I began to understand. And when he'd say, when he'd say choke note, when it'd come to the note, if you were listening, he'd go, he said, man, that's the choke note. And that's true. You just, you tighten your throat a little bit, you know, you get a little yeah. lump in your throat and it would be the unexpected note. And I really came to understand that and embrace it and try to apply it. You know, it's not a rule. There are no rules to any of it, but, but to recognize it when it turns up and flaunt it, <laughs> wow. you know, you, and to use it, yeah, to use it. Well, so I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for different things like that, you know, when I'm writing. And if you look at a couple of guys we talked about here, Mark, and Gilmore, I mean, absolutely, yeah, they're in melancholy, man. And it's and and yeah. it's the thing is when you have a good song like that and like your songs, what's nice is it doesn't leave you in there. It, right, you know, you touch there, and then at the end, you know, you're on this emotional, and it's like you feel better, but you got yeah. to keep your toe in. It's kind of a weird thing. I don't even know how it works. Yeah, yeah. Well, it certainly is with those two guys you mentioned. I, I, I don't know that it is with me, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm very happy with being nearly seventy years old now, and considering myself a writer yeah you know it was something i always dabbled in but i really feel like over the last 20 years i can put some music together now i'm not a lyricist i'm a crap lyricist you know but i feel pretty proud of this music i've been writing particularly as it's progressing and i'm i'm just wrapping up a a new album now that I'm calling a folk album, but 
I, I don't know that anyone else is going to hear it that way, but that's fine. It, that, it, that doesn't matter. But anyway, the writing in it, I'm, uh, I'm very pleased with. I felt like I've made some headway. Man, let me tell you, I've had close to coming up on 800 people I've had interviewed, right? Yeah. Probably four to five <clears throat> for Sidemen. I can't think of too many that have six albums out. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, it is impressive. I, yeah, you know something, really I, I came to it very late in the career, late in the game. And, and I never wanted to make records for myself. I always wanted to make records for somebody else. And, but part of it was, I wasn't really sure who I was anyway to make a record. I, I was approached to make a record um, in the mid eighties um, by a producer friend here in town. And uh, I, of course it was very flattering and it was for a major label and it was very flattering and then I got thinking, well, who the, what am I going to do? Who the hell am I? Uh, part, of the, part of the thing of being a session musician, as you know, is trying to be as many things to as many people yeah. as you can. And I certainly fulfilled that bill, as all good studio musicians do. But I've seen quite a, a number of them lose sight of who they were they they become so many different things and they can do so many different things and there's it's such a great craft and it's a proud craft but sometimes you lose track of what brought you to that party who you were when you came in and i certainly did i didn't know who i was anymore i could i could certainly turn the session trick all the time sure but when it came time to uh do something for me well I, what was i gonna do i was still kind of chasing rock and roll then a bit was i gonna do a rock and roll thing yeah was i gonna do a country thing no i didn't want to do a country thing uh, not that there's anything wrong with any of it uh, but i didn't want to do that i didn't at that time um, hadn't explored jazz enough to where I even vaguely remotely knew what I was doing with that. Well, it's interesting uh, because that's a progression I noticed where jazz became more involved in your catalog as it absolutely. went on. And yeah. it was really cool because it, you uh, just like everything else here, you have your own take on it. You know, you're not, yeah. Yeah. It's not like, oh, let me play like Wes Montgomery or, you know, let me, mm -hmm. whoever, you know, it's you with yeah. your, yeah, which was really cool. And, and, and I, yeah. yeah, I enjoyed that as I, as more I got into it. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the real breakthrough for me, I guess, was, was hooking up with Mark and uh, I don't know, I, when I turned 50 or something, I, I let go as, as we all do. I think around 50. Yeah. I started letting go of a lot of shit that didn't matter to me anymore. And what it included that was trying to be all things to all people. I, I'd done that and it was becoming increasingly harder for me to do that. And to finally shake hands and reconnect with who I am. And finally, at 50 years old, begin to groom that into something. I'd groomed everything else into stuff. I never, I never bothered with myself. And, and I think the confidence that I'd gained by, you know, having Mark accept me gave me the confidence to accept myself and shake hands with that, you know. Man, I give you a lot of credit because I'm sorry. Finish, please. No, and, and anyway, uh, and that's when I really started concentrating on all these things that I could do and that I loved, and 
and uh, quit apologizing for the fact that I like that, you know? Yeah. I like lounge music. Yeah. You know, I like 50s records. I like 60s movie instrumental music, you know? Yeah. Movie themes. So that, and that's, that's when that started happening. That's when that first album started happening. Yeah. I was gonna say, I give you a lot of credit because it's very hard, as you know, everybody says, I need to do X. And 99% mm -hmm. of it doesn't get done. And I'm not saying that in a condescending way mm -hmm. at all, but it takes a lot, especially when you are at a stage where you're doing something new and you're 50, not that it's mm -hmm. old, but you got to work, man. You, you had a, I mean, you didn't just go into, you had to work on, there was time and energy in figuring out how the hell you're going to do this, who you're going to yeah. be testing yeah. trial. I mean, I, I can't yeah. imagine how much went into that. First yeah. Thing. Well, it kind of coincided though with, um, um, with, with having more time, because we weren't touring constantly with Mark. We tour every other year, or maybe every third year. Plus, um, I, I, I sort of had a bit of a, a career crisis around that time. 96 was a funny year for me. Um, in that, you know, I, I, when we moved to Nashville in 1985, I came out here to produce records. That's yeah, I was going to ask you what, was, prompt, what prompted Yeah, I, want, I wanted to come out here and produce records. And I thought here was a better place to do it for me than LA was uh, for a number of musical reasons and also contacts that I've made here. Um, so that's what I came out to do. And the first, my first, you know, involvement in production here was Guitar Town, uh, Steve Earle, Steve. which ended up being a, a successful album. Huge. And that kind of threw the doors open uh, to the town for me as a record producer. And concurrently, I was, I was still doing a lot of session work. Um, here or in Nashville? Well here, I'm sorry, here or in LA? Uh, by the time I moved to Nashville and producing, I, I was doing a lot of session work here. Okay. Yeah, great. after we'd moved as well, that career took off here, which I didn't, that's not what I came out to do. And I didn't expect that, but it happily came along here as well. Um, and, uh, oh, so anyway, I'm losing the plot here. Oh, so anyway, <laughs> I'm, cha I'm, I'm chasing, <laughs> uh, I'm chasing record production here and did that for eight or 10 years, uh, actively. And I, I realized that the only thing I liked about producing records was actually making the record and every other attendant bit with it, I despised. Uh. I hated dealing with record companies. I hated the politics of it. I didn't enjoy, you know, searching for songs for artists. A lot of people enjoy that. I didn't enjoy that. Um, I didn't enjoy fucking A and R people <laughs> who, who didn't know what they were talking about. And I knew good A and R people, but at that period when I was producing records here, Belmont college, which had a, and has a very successful, uh, music business curriculum, as does uh, Middle, Tennessee, Middle Tennessee University. And of course, you know, kids going to college and they're in Nashville and, oh man, it's so sexy, man. I'm going to major in music and I'm going to major in music business. Well, the record companies found a, a fire hose of, of people, of kids coming out of these colleges uh, wanting jobs. And the way the companies dealt with it is they didn't give them jobs. They gave them internships, you know, which was uh, indentured servitude yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't pay them, you know. But eventually, some of these kids ended up trickling up the ladder. 
And a number of them ended up trickling up into the A&R department and they didn't know what the fuck they were doing. Yeah, that's gotta be awful. And, and not that I knew what I was doing, but I sure knew a lot better than that. Yeah. And so anyway, all of the, all of that, and man, I was just, I didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, so, you know, in 96, it was a decision that I made that I wasn't going to do that anymore. But it was a crisis because that's what I'd come out here to do and had succeeded at doing and, and sort of saw myself as that guy for a long time. And now I wasn't that guy anymore. I had to let it go. You know? How old and I did. You? So that was uh, 14, 24 years ago. So it was about 45. Uh, 45, okay. Yeah, that's, that's, 45, a, that's, that's, that's balls. That's not ballsy. But that's, you know, that's a big thing to do at that stage of the game. I, I've, yeah. I've learned through listening to many stories like this it has made it so critically important to me to just do what you like man you and i love hearing this because it's so it's so right it's so perfect in alignment with the world with what you know yeah. i mean it's just yeah you know, well right. that's what you've done that's what you've done you know reading your yeah kind of background yeah. Or yeah i have with this show for sure but you just get to a point i don't know you know and 50 seems to be a milestone for a lot of people that you realize God, I don't have anywhere near the time left on the back end <laughs> that I've lived in the front end. And, yeah. you know, what are you going to do at that time? Are you still going to like pretend to like stuff that you don't like yeah. or still hang around listening to stuff, waiting for it to dawn on you, but you don't really like it and, and do things that you just don't have time for anymore, you know? And it's, it's time to start looking after yourself. Yeah. So that's what I started. Doing. And that's when the writing really started taking shape. And I feel that it's, I, I, I mean, not to blow my horn in any way, but, but I feel like it's, it's slowly progressed through these last 20 some years, you know. Man, you've done a great job writing, arranging. You can, you know, I'll toot your horn, you, you know. You, no. These are no, really, you, are, you already, you already have <laughs> really good records, man. Really, oh, good records. thank you, thank yeah. you. Well, and and uh, something that's that's happening, uh, I think it's going to be out next month, is um, one of the the older albums, uh, an album called Code Red Cloud Nine, mm -hmm. which um, I was going through a really serious jazz binge. It's just free basing, you know, classic <laughs> jazz. And, and I was taking lessons and I was just into it. It really quickly began creeping into my, not that I consider myself a, a jazz player, but the, the writing, it really found its way into the writing. Anyway, I, I did an album of these kind of jazz flavored uh, tunes that I'd written. And... Uh, a company up in Indiana, a vinyl only company called Yield Brother Records, um, is releasing it on vinyl in, uh, I think it's out next month. We got the test pressings uh, several weeks ago and it's in, you know, it's being manufactured now. And this man, it was music that was written and recorded to be on vinyl. And yes. when, I, when I dropped the needle on the test pressing, man it was like oh god this is so right and you know i heard stuff in the record that i just didn't even hear on the cds anymore a vinyl to me is still the premium format to listen to music on cds are are fine but they don't have the depth and clarity to me and downloads are a poor cousin to cds and streaming is just, you know, a waste of time. Yeah. I mean, it's convenient. I get it. I get it. And that's fine. But as far as listening pleasure. Sure. Fidelity. So anyway, Yield Brother Records, yieldbrother.com. Uh, if anybody's interested in checking that out. And it'll be released on vinyl exclusively through them. And the package is great. And I wrote a 
little essay, an updated essay. Dwayne Eddy wrote the original liner notes. And I'm really proud of that album. Proud of the writing of that album. Um, even it's funny. I, there's a song on there I really like called "Right on the Price, Right on the Corner." That's even the, <laughs> yeah. even the name of it is like such a jazz name. Yeah, you know? yeah. There was a car dealership in in uh, Phoenix when I was growing up there as a kid that used to sponsor you know a Saturday night late night, <laughs> the late movie at ten thirty at night or something. I'm trying to remember the name of the dealership. Doesn't matter. Anyway, their their logo was you know, some, something, something cars. We're right on the price and right on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> but you, that, could, yeah. you could sort of, you know, make that into a hooker kind of thing, you know? It, hey man. It's how I, it's, it's how it's, I heard it. You know? It's just it's perfect jazz title, man. And, and I like <laughs> yeah. that song. Yeah. Um, what are some low points that you've been through and how'd you get through them? Uh, probably my darkest period. It's funny, my, my brightest periods and my most rewarding periods are with Mark Knopfler. And probably my darkest period was with Mark. Uh, and it was 96. And we'd done that album, Golden Heart, which ended up being his first solo album, Away From Straits. And not to do with uh, the hillbillies, you know. Uh, <laughs> and we started, we, well, the, you know, the Notting Hillbillies. Uh, we'd started that album in 94. Anyway, finished it up and they were booking, they wanted to book a tour to promote the album. And uh, I hadn't been on tour. Last time I was on tour was with Neil in 87. So whatever that was, eight or nine years. And uh so anyway, I, my, I, I don't know. In those years, I, I, as I say, was chasing producing records. My playing had kind of taken a backseat to producing. And I didn't really feel I was on my game in any way, particularly. I play on the records that I produced, but that, you know, that was different. You kind of sort of part out. And you could th especially if you're producing the record, you have a lot of time to think about it at home when you're not in the studio and and you got a lot of leeway <laughs> yeah come, come up and come up with very clever shit and then uh, <laughs> however however you needed to do it to to realize it on the record but you could you know you can do that making records uh but here i was faced with you know kind of being shoulder to shoulder with mark Knopfler. and i thought oh god you know and uh so that was sort of really weighing on me and I didn't, you know, once we got out there gigging, I really didn't feel like I was holding my end up at the bargain at all. I felt I was playing terribly. And uh, you know how that goes. It can kind of become a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy. Yeah. And Jesus, I'd come back at the end of the gig so depressed just hating myself and you know all the rest of the guys they'd go down to the bar for a man i hid out on that first tour and wow. i'd go back to the room and absolutely relive <laughs> every horror story <laughs> of that wow, of that game it's a good thing i didn't have a a cat of nine tails you know i'd have just <laughs> i'd have just made ribbons of myself yeah. but i did so mentally i didn't need to do it physically and this went on for months, and I was in a really bad way. And if I didn't have a nervous breakdown, if it wasn't a nervous breakdown, I think I probably cozied up pretty close to it being one. Oh, man, I was just... So that was going on, uh, co combined with the fact that I hadn't been kind of away from home at, at length like that for a good eight years or so. So that was kind of the tour itself was kind of weighing heavy, heavily on me. And then there was this other crisis going on about producing, you know, this identity yeah. crisis of, you know, what am I going to do when I'm done with this tour? Go back to, go back to Nashville and start soliciting production work? Man, no, I don't want to do that. But meantime, I'd kind of fallen out of the studio scene 
because I was playing right, playing, you know, producing records. I was really in a mess, you know, very dark, very dark. Uh, it's a good thing I, I wasn't drinking a lot because boy, I'd have really done some damage. Uh, but anyway, so a month before the tour was over, I remember specifically, you know, waking up in Madrid after having a horrendously <laughs> bad night and thinking, okay, this, this has got to stop, you know? And I kind of just cracked open, just cracked open the curtains and put an eye. And it was a beautiful day. And I thought, man, you know, you've got a month left on this tour and you're lucky enough to be in Europe and to be in Madrid today. And the Prada Museum is just two blocks away. And what are you doing, man? You know, get yourself out. It's going to be the last time you'll ever have a chance to go to Europe, A. You know that. So just, you know, that's given. Make, make the best of the last month that you've got. And I did. I got myself dressed and had some coffee and went to the Prada. And, and that was a turning point for at least getting through the rest of the gig. I, I, like I said, I'd resigned myself to the fact that I'd lost the gig already anyway. Of course, nobody has said anything. Yeah, was, did you talk to anybody? Like, like I'm no. sure you called your wife at home and talked to her. Oh yeah, oh god, but, it was it, it was bleak. Um, no, but of course, Mark had never said anything, and none of the guys had ever yeah. said anything. So it's something I'd sort of gotten planted a seed, and it it had just grown like kudzu, yeah, into, <laughs> <laughs> all over me. And, and uh, so anyway, that that was a beginning. That was a turning point of coming back. And, and I, I managed to get through the rest of the tour in a little brighter mood. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was absolutely the deepest and darkest. And that was, you know, that was Mark as well, although it had nothing to do with him. It, yeah, it had sure. to do with me, but it was in that period. And, uh, but <clears throat> the other thing was I, I made a little tentative plan to uh, what to do when I got home. Uh, one was not to pursue record producing. And two was to take a little short breather, a little rest, and try to pull myself up by the bootstraps as a player again. And, uh, you know, call my producer friends and say, look, I'm back in town. And if you need me, I'd like to get back in the trenches again. And, uh, and I did all of that. I did all of that. So, so there, so I felt like there was forward motion there and I'd sort of taken control of it and began to try to remedy some things. And then very shortly after that, like, you know, a few months after the tour was over, uh, my friend Chuck Ainley, who I mentioned earlier, called and said, look, Mark's, Mark wants to start another album right away. And uh, so what's your schedule? You know, we're looking at this date and this date and this date. And uh, are you available? I thought, Fuck yeah, I'm available. And right then I realized that dispelled everything. And you realize this was all you and it was just something that you created. It was all yeah, me. That you know? must have felt and, like and a fucking million it, pound weight after you got that oh phone man, call. I man. thought after, after convincing uh, myself that I would never hear from this guy again, for him to ask me to, to be on, on the next album, I thought, well, geez, you know, maybe I've done something right after all. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that was a huge turning point. And, and it was, it was, uh, yeah, I, I've been sort of upbeat and reasonably confident. I'm not an overly confident person anyway, but but uh, I've, I've been very upbeat about things since then, you know? 26 years later, something worked. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 
Uh, no, it's, uh, it's been a great adventure with Mark. A massive learning curve on, on all levels. And, and a worldliness there as well that I uh, originally got from Neil, but uh, really much deeper, you know, with Mark. And of course, I was older and able to appreciate it. Yeah. Take myself out and see these wonderful cities and do things and eat and drink for America. You know, God, we just, <laughs> we just eat so well. And yeah, so anyway. It's, it was the best of times and it was the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything, Richard, you haven't done yet musically that you'd like to do or anyone you haven't played with yet that you'd like to play with? They're all dead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just want to keep playing, you know. Um, and I don't, you know, there's so much I, as far as musically you haven't done. I, you never get to the bottom of it, do you? I don't That's think so. You're, you're always on a, on a path, always learning. And uh, no, you know, there's, I, I'm deficient in so many areas. So Where I do just, you feel you're deficient in? Because like I listen to you and I don't hear any. Uh, oh, well. I mean, you're your worst critic. I get it. But yeah, I don't know. You could just always be better at everything. Yeah. Better jazz player. You'd be a better rock player. You'd be a better everything. Uh, but I don't know. You know, I still I still buy books and poke through them, and uh, uh, I, I, I've uh, I, you know so uh, there are times, and for me, there are many uh, many periods that I go through that you sort of plateau off, you know, and and you're not particularly inspired at the moment by anything, or not particularly feeling creative, and man, that's when I turn to to things like instruction books again. And I'll let somebody else take the wheel and, and I'll just become a student again and stick my nose in the book. And invariably, I, of course, you're gonna learn something if you do that, which will then launch me off into a creative period. Right. So I've been doing that again. I bought a couple of books, a fantastic, not a household name guitar player, but a brilliant guitar player, a guy named Chuck Wayne from New York. And Chuck had been around since the 40s. A genius jazz player. He, he was the first guitar player in that really famous George Shearing Quintet uh, in the early 50s. But he was a great classical guitar player as well. Anyway, he put out two or three books, instruction books, and they're pretty dense going. It's pretty thick getting through the the, the woods there with it. But that's kind of what I'm doing right now. Right. And, uh, you know, I go through the Johnny, I always go back to the Johnny Smith, the complete Johnny Smith book. And uh, no, so I'm always, I'm always poking around at something. Yeah. Look, um, for idea, looking for idea prompts. Uh, well, uh, it, it, it ends up being idea prompts, but I'm just looking to plug up some, some holes in my knowledge, you know, yeah. of the instrument. And it's like Swiss cheese for me. You know? Oh, come on, man. It really is. It really is. Uh, but that's, you know, the whole point of that is, is, is that you never get to the bottom. Yeah. I think in any, any, any professional and any career is always, you know, anybody who says, Oh, I've, I've got it. You always got to kind of wonder yeah. question that, you no know, way. there's no way. I have this expression, stupid people realize, no, smart people realize how little they know and stupid people think they know everything. Right. And right. I just, from observation, I've, 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 you know, I'm sure I could use something a little more eloquent than stupid people, but you know, I'm <laughs> from the Bronx. I can only go so far with this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your go-to guitar right now? And what other two guitars would round out your top three? And has that changed over the years? Oh, okay. It changes all the time. Um, uh, here you go. Right. right on, man. Right here. It's a 1954 Tele. Uh, and I'm playing the hell out of that these days. That's it. That looks beautiful, man. Is that like new, uh, new fretboard? or No, it's just all original. That you know? looks great, man. It's really clean. Great shape. Yeah. It's a great guitar. Where did you get that? Well, it was, um, it was a gift from a very good friend. That's awesome. 
Very cool, man. An awesome gift. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, took me, it took me three or four days to be able to compose a, a thank you note, even. For, it was just overwhelming. Yeah. I can understand that. Yeah. So that's your number one right now. What would be two oh, and three? At the moment, yeah, yeah. Um, what else? I've uh, uh, I've been playing uh, a 1936 D'Angelico that I have, Excel model. I've been playing that a lot. Is that hollow body? Uh, yeah, an arch top guitar. Uh, and I've also been playing. Uh, I just recently got a um, uh, Les Paul a Custom Shop 58. Oh, cool. Um, that I got a few years ago that was made in 2012 that I absolutely adore. Uh, and I've been playing that a lot as well. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, but funnily enough, I never, I never plug a guitar in at home. You know, whether I'm playing the, the, the Les Paul or the any kind of an electric. I never plug it in. I just sit there and play it. You know? Just play around. Yeah. I, I never plug in unless I'm in the studio. What are you playing through most of the time in the studio and on stage? Well, on stage, I use an AC30, a Vox AC30, and a Tone King Imperial. And uh, in the studio these days... I, I mean, I use all kinds of amps, but uh, Tone, Tone King also uh, made a model. God. Uh, That's the guy down here in Florida, isn't he? Like in Orlando, I think. No, I think they were up in Maryland, unless, unless that's okay. changed. No, it could be. Uh, uh, I could, I'm probably the wrong guy. The Tone King Falcon Grande. And it's a single 12, and it's just a great sounding amp, you know? It's one of those amps you plug in and just music. Yeah. That's very musical. You don't have to dick around with a lot of stuff. And, uh, and it doesn't have a lot of knobs on it either. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not big on that, man. I'm like, no, me I'm like simple, very oh, simple. Me too. I'm just completely flummoxed by any kind of technology as you've sorted out by now. So simple and uh, just plug in and go. You know? Yeah. That's yeah. what I like. Well, it's it's the reason I never kind of got into pedal boards and all of that stuff. You know, do you use any pedals? I don't. You don't? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't. Occasionally, occasionally, I'll uh, if if I'm playing through an amp that doesn't have internal tremolo in it, and I want that, you know, then I'll plug a little tremolo unit in and go into that. Uh, it's just all too confusing for me, you know. No, I agree with you. I'm I'm overwhelmed with just trying to play the instrument. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. I, exactly. <laughs> I've got my hands full with that. And uh, so in a way, you know, my guitar, my lack of effects, if you will, becomes its own effect. Yeah. Um, and I found, you know, doing sessions everybody else is is completely maxed out with pedal boards and before that it was these giant refrigerator racks of stuff. Bradshaw stuff yeah and before that it was pedal boards again <laughs> you know? uh, and it's all everybody's so processed out which is fine it's okay um, but if you got two guitar players who are real processed it's like it always cancels itself out somehow so if one guy's real straight, which I guess would be me, and the other guy is, is processed, well, that's it. It's, it, it. You've got room for two different things. Yeah. M Mark doesn't use a lot of pedals, I wouldn't imagine either, does he? Yeah. No. Yeah. Pretty organic. Yeah. That's, that's not to say that there isn't, there isn't echo and there isn't stuff put on sort of after the fact, but it tends to be more in the control room area than floor pedals sure and that stuff sounds better anyway you know yes. the quality of that is so much cleaner and bigger you know and it's more controlled exactly right mm -hmm. exactly right and you can get a good man you can get a, just such a great big guitar sound if you don't put a lot of shit on it yeah you know 
and put a oh, mic in front of the thing and then process it however you want afterwards but oh you got a you got a big big signal to work with then yeah you know? totally hey do you have any uh interesting stories about how you acquired any of your guitars well certainly that 54 telly is a gift is, a, is an interesting story but yeah. anything else oh god um well yeah uh that d'angelico that i was telling you about um 36 that's a that's old man that's almost 100 years it's like 80 yeah, years it's old a, it's a proper real d'angelico yeah um and uh so anyway you know that's uh, d'angelicos are sort of the holy grails for guitar players there were so relatively few of them made and they're absolutely killer guitars and uh i don't know i i we were working in in new york with mark we had a little residency and uh he had a residency where uh at uh uh, at the Beacon, I think at the Beacon we were. What a great uh, man! I've been to that theater several times. What a yeah. great. Yeah. Is it as good to play on from stage as it is yeah. to hear? Yeah. Oh my God! It's it's, it's a wonderful place. Oh, it's, it's more. Yeah. Anyway, you know, I always go up and see my friend Rudy Pensa up there, and uh, you know, Rudy's got all the D'Angelicos. So I don't know. He he had five or six of them out. We went up to to a little loft up there at his shop and he had them all out on the couch you know and on the floor and we were just looking at them and playing them and smelling them and you know how you are with with guitars anyway i absolutely fell in love with this 36 d'angelico and it was a lot of money you know and uh i'd never spent that much money on a guitar and uh of course mark was there with me and Glenn was there with me as well. And, you know, it was just love at first sight. I couldn't, I couldn't stop playing this thing. And uh, so that was that. And I, you know. They so, got you over your guilt? They did. They did. <laughs> Both Mark and Glenn. Good friends. That's good Guy friends. Arthur and Guy Fletcher. And said, man, you know, and it was Glenn who finally said, you know, the hardest thing is going to be writing that check. He said, once you've signed that check, you're never going to miss a penny of it. And yes. Right. Yeah, man. Right. Uh, but that was an arm twisting purchase that I was so glad that uh, that happened. Uh, and how, wait, how long ago did you get that? Um, about four years ago. Yeah, and here you are still playing it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, regularly. So that's yeah. cool. But it was one of those. It was one of those purchases that I had to check in at City Hall. Yeah, you know? honey, honey. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure she said, "Like, do whatever you want to do." Yeah, of yeah, course. yeah. Of course. yeah. Uh, anyway, it's yeah, and I don't, how, I don't miss a penny of it. <laughs> it's amazing how, like, when you don't buy tons of gear, your wife is always like, "Get it." Yeah. But the guys who are bitching, oh, I got to hide it from my wife. Well, you get 300 guitars. I, I mean, well, I, 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 I could sort of understand that. I know, yeah. I've <laughs> you know? Kind of gotten over that. Although, I've, you know, the thing is I've amassed so many guitars around here because I just don't sell anything. So, you know, I've got my first guitar from when I was a kid. Which is? Uh, which is, was a little Mexican guitar that my parents bought me. I've been pestering them for a guitar. Um. Is that the one you played with Al Casey? I'm sorry? Is that the one you played with Al? Uh, no. No, I'd, I'd sort of uh, grown out of that guitar by then. But uh, no, we were living in Phoenix at the time. And my parents would occasionally go down for a weekend to just cross the border to Nogales uh, occasionally. And uh, they bought me a little Mexican, little three-quarter Mexican guitar. It was just hanging on the wall over here. Uh, so anyway, I mean, I've got every instrument I've ever had. So it's a lot of stuff. You know? Well, let me know when, when the uh, Richard Bennett liquidation sale. <laughs> <laughs> Any minute now. I'd like to come up just to look at, you know, I'll be, I'll be you looking at the guitars like you were with the D'Angelico. <laughs> um, 
Here's a tough question. Favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with? And man, you've played with some tremendous ones. Oh, well, you know, Mark would certainly top that list. Yeah, I gotta believe that. Um, and uh, God, I don't know, Albert Lee. Um, you know, there's so many great, you know, Earl Palmer. Uh, back when I was doing sessions in in L.A., those guys were monster musicians. Um, you know, I got I got to do a session with Howard Roberts. Oh wow! Yeah, I mean, not for him. He was just on the date. He and I were. He. he uh, that's so cool. Day. Yeah, and uh, you know, guys like Hal Blaine and uh, Joe Osborne and. I don't know. On and on it goes. And I do have to say that my two long road uh, associations uh, with Neil Diamond and with Mark, those bands were just stellar. They were absolutely great bands. Uh, Neil's band in the, particularly in the 70s, was just killer. Just great. And, and Mark, Mark's situation for 25 years has just been staggering. That musicianship and that within that band. Man, I'm always the squeaky wheel in it. Um, no, guys. I don't, I would doubt that. Everybody in that, but when you have everybody at that degree, a level, everybody's thinking I'm the squeaky wheel here. Yeah, maybe. Maybe yeah, so. Yeah, I think so, man. Maybe so. But I mean, but because who walks around thinking, man, I'm so much better than all these guys? <laughs> <laughs> like that's not normal for like no, a, a, no. A, a a you know like a normal musician doesn't think like you know that had a good successful career <laughs> you know humility is part of the a key component of that you know not arrogance you know so i mean i, I couldn't see it yeah. um if if you could answer and if not i totally get it mm -hmm. it once covid's over will mark be coming back out i don't know i yeah. i i think um what happens next is uh, we, we've got to record an album, a new album. Okay. You know? um, and then you have a proper touring cycle. Yeah, that's right. Oh. And then we'll see. I don't that, know. Man, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Oh, I would love, I would love nothing better. Oh. But, uh, but nobody, you know, nobody is uh, in a hurry to do any sessions at the moment. Yeah, I totally get that. I understand. I, I tried to get a little session together for myself to finish up a, a new album that I'm working on that's finished except for one more tune that's ready to go. And, uh, you know, a couple of the guys are, are nervous about it. I completely understand. I completely understand. So. Yeah. Strange times, man. Yeah, it really is. Tell me your, uh, Top three Desert Island discs, Richard, just for this moment, because that could change like in 10 minutes. Oh, I know. I know. Well, um, I mean, there are certain things I go to that are continually inspiring. Um, and, and one is the Charlie Parker and Strings album. Um, I, I never fail to enjoy every moment of that um your passion for jazz man has been made so clear to me through this conversations we've had man you yeah, really yeah you, you really respect the genre and and um it's just not it's very nice to uh, you know i'm not a jazz guy per se but it's nice when you see someone that likes something so yeah viscerally you know it's it's nice it's it's something I've always aspired to, and it's one of my great failings. <laughs> you know, that's one of those things you're just continually working on. Yeah. And, uh, so anyway, there's that. Um, there was a wonderful box set that came out about ten or twelve years ago uh, on proper records from Britain, and it was a four CD thing called. Uh, I think the Cosimo Matassa story. And 
he was the great engineer who had the studio there in New Orleans who cut 90% of all the great R&B records that came out of um, New Orleans. What's his name? Cosimo Matassa? Matassa, yeah. Cosimo. Nice. Yeah. And his studio was Cosmo's studio. Um, and it's staggering, man. It's just a wealth of that brilliant R&B from the late 40s through the early 60s there in uh, New Orleans. So I would say maybe that. And uh, there's a wonderful Johnny Smith compilation that came out a while ago. I mean, I've got everything, but as a, you know, as an introduction to Johnny Smith, if you will, uh, I think it's called Spring is Here. And it was all his great roost recordings. And uh, I, I don't know, you know, Johnny Smith is, if somebody put a gun to my head and said, you can only pick one guitar player, who's your favorite guitar player? You know, no, man, you can't. Okay, you know, they cock the gun. <laughs> Johnny Smith. Johnny Smith for you. Johnny Smith would be it, yeah. I, I got to tell you, for this, all three of them, almost mm -hmm. 800 interviews, first time selections. Never heard of any three, three of these before. That's really, oh, really? cool. Yeah, oh, very man. cool. Well, Go straight to, uh, well, any any three of them. I, I think you'd be rewarded. I'm going to, for sure, man. Um, do you listen to Johnny Smith at all? I have not. You're, I, I'm just getting turned on to him, embarrassingly, from but, you. No it's, no, it's fine, man. Uh, killer. I'm going to check him out, for sure. Spring really? is here. And I want to look at that box, the R&B box, because I'm very much into R&B. Yeah, oh, there you go. Uh, I don't know if it's available anymore. I'm sure all of this is online. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure it's all on Apple Music. It's funny, my kids, you may have the same thing with your kids. My, my, your guys are a little older than mine, but my son will come to me, well, particularly the 28-year-old, he, he'll say, um, man, this is great. Do you have any of this? And it's like the Temptations. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I've got a couple of their songs. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's you know. the best thing, man. It's the best thing when they do that. Yeah. Of course, I've, I've got... God, I've got about 7,078s. I mean, I'm just a record. Oh, wow. Man. And, you know, a room full of albums and 45s. And, uh, so it's like a working library. Yeah. And my kids were always, uh, you know, welcome to it. So it's like, uh, I mean, it was nothing for my 12-year-old son to be into the Mills Brothers or something, you know? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah. They're just pretty wide-ranging tastes. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm, I'm telling you, man, I'm seeing this whole, you need a manager, though, man, the liquidation between the records and the guitars, man. I'm, this is, I'm starting to think about This is more <laughs> than one human being can manage, man. <laughs> uh, best decision you ever made, Richard? Um, the best decision I ever made was to, was to leave Phoenix and go pursue my career in Hollywood. Uh, and I was, uh, I just graduated high school and I didn't want to leave. Um, I, I, I loved Phoenix. Uh, <clears throat> and I was, and I was, working you know i'd already established myself playing in bands and stuff and you know you have to remember that in the 60s in a medium-sized town like phoenix was then it's a sprawl now but um man if you could as a musician if you could knock down a six night a week gig at some place if you could make a hundred 25, 150 bucks a week, man, you could buy a, a little home and raise a family and live off of that. Awesome. And I was on my way to doing that. I loved the town so much, but I'd already hooked up with Al Casey and I knew what I wanted to do. Uh, and, but it was a hard thing to leave into that sprawl of LA 
And there's no guarantees, man. I wasn't that great of a player anyway. I didn't know, you know, I was just a kid who, you know, had this dream. I, I wanted to be, I wanted to do what Al Casey was doing. Yeah. But there are no guarantees, even if you know the man himself, sure. to get in and do that. Um, so it was very scary. I give you so much credit for doing that. That's so, and your folks are behind you, you said, right? All, all the way? Yes, yeah, they were. They were really good about that. And, and I suppose the other, the other great decision I made, uh, and again, it was a frightening move, was uprooting out of L.A. then, after I'd established myself there, to move to Nashville. And uh, there was no guarantees there either. But the path you took there was so cool. I, I gave you, again, I give you credit for you. You did this thing and it wasn't you. Uh, it, as sorry. far as like production, you know, you got into production, you did it at a yeah. high level, you were very busy. And then you just realized, you know, this really isn't my thing. Oh yeah. Well, the, the reason I came here to Nashville was to get, to get into producing records. Yeah. I've done a bit of it in, in LA, but I really saw that as my future at that time. Because I figured I'd had my career already playing. And it wasn't that I was giving that up, but I, that just seemed the next logical thing for me to do. And uh, I, I'd been coming to Nashville for a couple of years prior to moving here in 85. I'd started coming out in 81 or 82, uh, commuting and playing on projects. And I liked the feel of it. And I knew a lot of the guys here and, and a lot of LA people had begun moving here as well. But I just thought I wanted to make records a certain way. And uh, I saw that happening here rather than in LA. Uh, but it was a crapshoot, you know, and to uproot your family. And we had kids at that point, and um, it was scary. It was a yeah, scary time. Very much. Uh, until, until I got established a bit. Uh, and my wife didn't particularly love it at that time. And I just thought, man, what, what have I done? I've completely... I fucked up my own career and, you know, then I've dragged my family into this as well, you know, man. Anyway. Those are tough decisions, man. Yeah. But it ended up, it ended up being the right one. Uh, tough question. What do you like most about yourself? Oh, um, yeah, well, God, I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I like to think that I'm a kind person. Um, I suppose that, you know, my old man was a kind person. That was kind. Yeah. Yeah. That is a tough question. Uh, what would your wife say she likes most about you? Oh, probably the fact that I've been away for so many years touring. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Absence makes the heart grow fonder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gee, I don't know. Maybe you know. You know, maybe it just goes back to that kind kindness thing. You know? Yeah, man, kindness is uh, not. Uh, it's more important than I think people. You don't hear people talking about kindness, but no. I think it's pretty important. I think it's important to be kind to yourself. Well, that's hard to do sometimes. You know? Yeah, yeah. But if you could do, my experience anyway, if, if, when I started being a little kinder to myself, it became suddenly much easier to be kinder to others. Yeah, yeah. That Which humility, is, I think, will take you a long way. Yeah, I would agree with you, man. Uh, who's had the biggest influence on your life, musically and also personally? Hmm. Well, I would have to say Al Casey, you know, uh, there, there are a million people along the way who you can 
sight, but Al was just a, it was like a lightning rod for me, you know, just, it, it, he, he, um, I don't quite know how to say it. It just, he gave my life purpose. He was the reason I wanted to try to become a studio musician. That's so cool, man. And, uh, you know, and then uh, once I got to to know him so well, uh, the greatest gift he gave me, and he taught me many things, but beyond that was, um, he gave me a place to be. In that, especially at that time, he had a, he had a music store. He and his wife in Hollywood. So it was a place to hang out. It was a place to. I taught there. Yeah, you remember you talked about that. You said you got really networked into the whole community. Exactly. There. Yeah, I met that's... everybody through him. Yeah, and those doors kind of parted, you know, and uh, so both musically and personally. Yeah. Okay. So. He wasn't always the best role model. <laughs> I won't get into to that, but he had his problems. But um, I don't know, you know. And and I have to include, you know, I have to include Mark into that as well, you know, sort of bookending Al very early on. And uh, man, I've learned so much from Knopfler. Um, just about music, you know, some you know some specific guitar things, but just in a broader sense, in a musical, global sense, man. What a writer! Gee, what a writer that guy is. I, I mean, in, insane. Yeah, I know. I, uh, I I think he's. I think the guitar thing has overshadowed. I, I think people think of him first as a guitar player, and that's understandable. Totally, yeah. But I think it's overshadowed his writing. And really, he, he and I have talked about this. He sees himself as a writer first. And the guitar thing uh, just comes along, it comes along with the package. It's important. It's the means to the end. Yeah. 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 But it's always about the song. It's always to serve the song and that's the other thing man if, if if i can distill 25 or 26 years of knowing him into one you know axiom it's it's you're there to serve the song and that's really what a great not that i'm a great musician but that's what any great musician will tell you absolutely that's what, that's what doing session work is about and that's what being a side man is about you're there to serve the song, not yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yourself will come along if you serve the if you serve the other purpose. You know. Uh, Do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music, Richard? Besides uh, books. Yeah, I like to read. Um, yeah, unfortunately, not. I'm, I'm pretty. Um, and your and your what do you call it, man? Your wheel your wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty. You put it on your website. You don't have a lot of stuff on your website. That's pretty tragic, you know, <laughs> to, <laughs> to be touting your wheelbarrow. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I listen to records a lot, but it's it, it tends to be all centered around music and pretty sure pretty blinkered. I think. Favorite place you've traveled? You've been all over the world multiple times. Oh, yeah. Italy. Love Italy. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I love it all, man. I love it all. I just love traveling. Yeah. You know, I've done Thank God that. for that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I've been spoiled in both of my long-term touring situations. Yeah, both with Neil and and with Mark, uh, that we travel well. Yeah, you know? you're not waiting on coach. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a gift, awesome. man. That's cool. Like, and eat good food and eat and drink for America, and I don't know. I've been very lucky. Yeah. 
I, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know if Mark is going to do any more touring or not. Uh, I don't see Neil touring anymore. And uh, I'm just beginning to grapple with the, I, the idea that uh, that may be done for me now. Yeah. Uh, this is, this uh, is the, and this is the problem. This is the big question mark with COVID. Mm-hmm. Exactly right. In the history of our lives, me and you, mm-hmm. and, and everybody listening to this, there has never been that much uncertainty about not just tomorrow, next week, next month, six months, a year. That's right. There's never been that much. And that is what makes people, in my opinion, antsy. Yeah. Not knowing anything. It's That's a right. fucking scary thing. Yeah. It sure is. It sure is. And as it wears on now, you know, what are we into nine months of it? Eight months of it? Yeah, um, yeah, probably. You know, everybody's grappling with it in a different way. You know. Um, oh, yeah. None of them are generally too good. Coping skills are not running super high. No. And, yeah. And, and uh, I, I think you're starting to see a lot of depression. And uh, understandably. Yeah, totally. So, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've dealt with it. Um, I just try to stay on schedule and, and do my gym stuff and get my, my workout in every day and cook and read and stay busy and practice and write. And, uh, but the, I tell you, I, I do have my moments now. You know, how can you not? Even when you're regimented, because at a certain point, you know, regimentation is tip, discipline is typically exercised for a reason, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? You know, I'm sacrificing this to make the record. I'm practicing this to get ready to warm up for the tour in six months. Exactly. Yeah. The the the, the discipline is great, but when there's like an, an ambiguous why am I being this? It's hard to do, man. And everybody, I think, loses it, their shit. Yeah, it is. And I've, I've, you know, spoken to some of my musician pals, and that that uh, is starting to set in. Yeah, a lot of people. You know, what am I doing? What am I practicing for? Right. Yeah, yeah I've talked to a ton of guys. That, that, that saying, you know, that's the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm not quite there yet. I'm not Good. Plugging away. Good. I can't. Good. I, I just got too much stuff to learn. <laughs> to learn. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Uh, toughest decision you had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? And you might have said it already as far as leaving oh. Phoenix. Yeah, I don't know. I think those would have been those two big moves for me. Life-changing and very difficult. And last question, and I just want to thank you again for all your... He's just a very nice guy, easy guy to talk to, man. And, oh, and I man. hope, oh. you know, at some point in time we get to sit down and have a cup of coffee. And, Wouldn't that be great? Or a... Uh, We'll have a Zoom cup a, a, a Casa, a, ca, a Casami. I just told you the name of the tequila, Casamigos, I think it's yeah, called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'd be great, man. So uh, where, you're down in Tampa. Yeah. I'm in Tampa, yeah. Tampa. yeah. I'm in Tampa. So if you're, in Ar- if you're coming to Orlando, I'll be there, man. <laughs> I'll be there. I've been to Orlando. We usually go, uh, you know where Probably, App- huh? Apalachicola is? Right, up in the Panhandle, yeah. The, yeah. Just in, in yeah. the Gulf there is where we usually go to uh, St. George Island. Uh, when you're with Mark, you must come down here, though. Uh, Ruth Eckerd Hall, probably, or Capitol yeah, Theater. We, we played Miami a few years ago at the Jackie Gleason Theater. Right. Jackie Gleason did his show. All right. Uh, yeah. But it's been a long time since, since we were there. I'm, I'm thinking that was 2008. Oh, that's quite some time ago. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, we need to go have a drink. Yeah, we need to have a drink, man. Solve the world's problems. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, last, I'm here. Yeah, give a give a call, man. I'm always. I, I will have a have a chat. You know. I will. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, biggest change in your personality over the last ten years, and how much of that has been deliberate, and how much has just been a natural part of aging? Wow, <laughs> man, you asked the tough stuff. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, I think uh, I'd have to say uh, I, I, don't, I don't give a shit about a lot of stuff anymore like I used to. Uh, and that's the unnecessary stuff. Yeah, like you lighten the load off your own shoulders. Yeah, man. Yeah. And, and what I really, really care about now, and it took me a while to – to get there uh, is what's important, man. Your family and your friends. And in my case, my work. And uh, that's it. I, I can let stuff go pretty easily now. Which is so healthy, man. And it's just like a million pound weight off your shoulders, isn't it? I'll tell you, I'll tell you when that started happening. I don't, I don't, you're younger than I am, so I don't know if you're you're there yet or not, but I was sometime right around, I mean, not exactly on my birthday, but sometime right around when I turned 50, I, I, stuff started just peeling away, you know, that, that didn't mean anything anymore to me. And, uh, and I found that just that continues as you get older. Um, you know, I just, I just turned 69 um, over this summer. And man, it's just, it's so freeing, you know, and uh, I, knock wood, I'm, I'm, I'm in good health and I'm, I'm pretty fit and I feel good. I still feel like I'm going to live forever, you know, but it's just a lighter load somehow, you know. I still think I'm going to be the guy with the cockroaches who are going to inherit the earth. You know, <laughs> the roaches are going to be crawling around. Man, I feel the same way. But I, I feel honestly, that yeah. way. You know, yeah. I, I, so many people I talk to, you know, it's, it's like they're planning to die or something. But fuck, man, not me. I, yeah. I still feel like I'm 30. Uh, I, I know that's not the case, but that's how I feel. But exercise has so much to do with that, man. It does. You know, I didn't come. That's something that I came to at 50 as well. Really? I remember being out on tour. It's 2001. And I turned 50 in London. And I just was depressed. And, thought, oh, fuck. and I never did anything. I never did any exercise. Uh, I, I, didn't do, I didn't do sports as a kid. But I, I was always pretty trim, so I never felt I had to exercise, you know. But I turned. 50 he never smoked. And I, oh yeah, I smoked. Yeah. Oh, you did. Yeah, I did. Oh, wow. Two thousand eight. Um, Good for you but, for stopping. But uh, but I just started feeling like shit. I I felt like I was falling apart physically, and uh, you know, Mark and Glenn and a few of those guys we're working out all the time, you know, in the hotels and stuff. And we were and I thought, man, maybe there's something to this. Uh, so I waited until the tour was done and I figured I've, I've got two, I'm at a crossroads. I can either get myself a really good rocking chair and <laughs> or let's see if there's something to this working out thing. I can get so a I, rocking chair or I can start working out. <laughs> And uh, so I classic. the wellness center up in our hospital that's just a few miles from us. Right. And got on a program. And within a week, man, within the first week, it changed my life. Yeah. And I, I've not looked back since. Man. Every day I do, I do something. I think that is, and I read a lot about health, not much about, I'm not a big reader, but I do read a lot about health. Yeah. That is the greatest single medicine that you can do for your body on a regular basis, man. Big Eat time. healthy and exercise and get moving. Big time. Yeah. And the other thing is it, it kind of keeps the, uh, uh, it keeps the dark shadows away. Totally. You know? Yeah. I, I used to be a little prone to 
the dark side <laughs> of things. And, and it's just kind of holds that at bay. Wonderful. Totally. Yeah. That's yeah. good, man. Good to do that. Yeah. At around 50, when I, I'm 57. And when I, when I hit 50 around the same thing happened to me, it's, I just, mm -hmm. I made a conscious decision. I said, you know, I'm responsible for a lot of the things that are stressful in my life. Right. I can't be, resp I can't control the things I'm not responsible for, but I can control that. And I just dropped them all. Yeah. Like, like flicking a light switch off and my whole life was so much better and yeah. literally overnight. Yeah. It was and really I'm just weird. Basically a different person now, you know? Yeah. So anyway, right that, on, man. That was a good decision. <laughs> uh, decision. Let me tell people where to find you and what you got going on. Uh -huh. uh, Richard Bennett is by far, and I'm not saying this to blow smoke up his ass, he is the, <laughs> literally the most successful sideman I have had on this show. He's wow. had a career that is like, you know, you read about, you know, his, like Al Casey as to him, that's what he is to anybody that's modern playing sessions and he's just a lovely guy um i i went originally to listen you know i always listen to my guest's last record and i wound up listening to his whole catalog he's a really great songwriter um in in, in lots and he's got his own unique sort of like surf slash blues slash funk but it's it works it's not like you know sometimes you see a guitar player and he's doing oh surf and then he's doing blues and then <laughs> you know but you know what i'm talking about that's not yeah. your stuff you have a specific style that incorporates a, a bunch of of genres and it's it's great and your songwriting is wonderful um so i would love everybody to go to richard bennett.com richard dash bennett b-e-n-n-e-t-t.com uh, everything that you'd want to know about him and his wheelbarrow is there. Uh, also, uh, all of his music is on iTunes uh, from themes from a rainy decade. Uh, he's got a record out called Code Red Cloud Nine, which has got some great Casey's Place. I love it's one of my favorite songs and uh, oh, right on price, right on the corner. Uh, um, that record is being released re-released on red vinyl and if you'd like to get a copy of that go to yield brother y-i-e-l-d brother.com and also richard is uh the most invisible man in the world but he does have a facebook fan page and so go there and like it and um man just listen to this guy's music he, he's just there's a reason why he's had such a great career and it doesn't oh. stop with what he can do to serve other people it's his music is is wonderful um, far too kind. Right? No, man. I'm just telling it like it is, man. You know, that's it. I would say nothing. Is there anything else that uh, you want to turn people on to or that I could, you know, promote or anything like that? No, that's kind of you. No, I think that's that's plenty. Okay, he's cringing. Uh, <laughs> my least favorite subject. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, hang on one second. I'm just to say goodbye and wrap it. Thank you for everything, man. I really appreciate oh, you. Thank Every you. You're welcome. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Richard Bennett. Please check out all of his music, which you could stream it everywhere and go to richard-bennett.com and uh, check out Code Red Cloud 9 on red vinyl at yieldbrother.com. And most important, man, especially nowadays, remember that happiness really is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Richard, thank you so much, brother. Awesome.